So you can start recording. Yep, we're good. Okay, good evening, everyone. Today is August 5th, 2020. Welcome to the CEC meeting for the month of August. Nice to see our participants, and we thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'm going to call the meeting to order, and uh, I'd like to start with Carly and the roll call, please. Joseph Benedetto. Present. Christine Coniglio. Wait, I couldn't find the unmute. I'm here. <laughs> here. Okay. Lily Guigianti. Here. Monica Patino. Present. Edward Kim. Edward, are you on? I'll come back. Victor, Victor Lee. Present. Juana Rivera. Present. Present. Edward and Kim, are you still on? Are you on? Okay. All right. Okay, so before we get started, so we have a quorum present, we can move forward in terms of making any decisions. But uh, before we start, just for uh, either Lewis or Carlos, I'm getting a, a notification that a parent uh, cannot chat, can, cannot type into the chat. Is there something that's blocking them or? So if the chat's not working, I, I would suggest that you leave. Uh, yeah, William Zhu just commented in the chat that everything is okay. Um, just I would suggest leaving the meeting and entering it again, and that might fix the problem. We won't have to back in the meeting. Okay, but so if the that, chat room is on and people are using it. So if you understood the message, please you know reconnect, and uh, we will try to uh, monitor the chat as well. Okay, so um, the, the CEC members should have gotten the minutes from our July meeting. So I'd like to, at this time, go through that and get those meetings, uh, minutes approved. Are we able to do that, guys? Do I have any motions to approve the minutes for the uh, first annual meeting for July? Motion to approve. Christine made the motion. Anyone's going to second? Second. I'll second it. Who's that, Akilah? Yes, it's me. Okay. So the minutes are hereby approved. Welcome, everyone. Uh, once again, I'd like to congratulate the officers who were elected for the 2000. 2021 term here at the CEC. I am the acting president, and we pretty much have a very busy meeting this evening. I just want to jump right into it. Uh, I, I know we have a lot of questions and concerns about school openings and what the schools will look like and what the protocol will be and so on and so forth. So we've asked um, the director of school facilities for the borough of Queens to join us. And I wanted to introduce to you and uh, welcome Mr. Hugh Dodoni. Are you here, Mr. Dodoni? Mr. Dodoni is here, yes. Dodon, I'm so sorry. That's okay. Okay. So um, why don't we start with Mr. Dodoni? Do you have, uh, I know we uh, talked about what some of the issues were. Do you have a brief introduction? before we jump into questions about specific uh, concerns and specific schools? Well, I'd just like to tell you, I've been fielding a lot of questions in reference to cleaning protocols, and I'd be willing to answer any of your questions. Uh, we're moving forward with the school opening set for September 10th, uh, and I'm here to answer any of your questions and try to make you feel as comfortable as I can. Okay, so for those who do not know what school facilities does, School facilities maintains the buildings in our in within our district, correct? So correct. Um, if there's anything that deals with uh, taking certain precautions or doing certain things with respect to the buildings, these are questions that we would ask facilities, correct? That's correct. 
Okay, so I know we had asked the community to submit some written questions. Why don't we start with the written questions? Carly, you should have some of them, right? Um, for Mr. Dodonna, and then uh, we'll monitor um, the chat. Uh, we're gonna be, because we have different things we have to discuss this evening, we, we're, we're, gonna res we're not gonna reserve the public uh, discussion for the end of the meeting. What we'll do is if there's any questions that we have for Mr. Dodonna before he leaves, we will uh, entertain uh, public comments at that time. So either you're going to have to go on to the, our, our site to uh, let us know that you want to comment or uh, submit your name through the chat. And I want to remind you that we allow three minutes of public comment per uh, commentator. Okay, Carly, let's start with the questions. Well, pertaining just to like school facilities or just in general, all the public Let's start with questions pertaining to school facilities. We had a couple of questions. I, regarding. I see one here. Um, can you hear me? Um, okay, PS184 does not have a central air system, but does have individual units in several classrooms. Parents have inquired about purchasing air filters for each classroom as per the guidelines for safe reopening. On behalf of the parent community, is this something that can be done using either school budget or PTA funds? And is the DOE approved models or vendors? Okay, so your question is in reference to the filters of individual air conditioning window units. Am I correct? Right. Okay, so those filters are provided by the custodian. It's that is part of their budget. It, it's no additional expense to the custodian that's built into their budget. So that that the that's the answer. It's built into the custodian's budget, and it's it's been there forever. And we replace those filters every season. Hi, this is. Hi, this is Principal DeMilta, and I just want to clarify, I am aware that they do replace the air condition filters. The question that came to me was regarding separate filtration units that can filter the air in each classroom. And that was the question, if, if that's something that can be purchased or that's available through DOE vendors for purification of the air in each classroom. We have vendors at the DOE that you could purchase uh, directly from or through a third party agreement. Um, but if you're asking in reference to the air as an, ad an addition to what we're already providing, we already have an exchange of air through air blowers and exhausters. And there's filterization on an existing system. So unless I, I can speak of your particular building, what you have, um, you have the ability to purchase additional, um, ventil you know, ventilation. Thank you. Keep going. Let me just make a couple of comments because I have some other questions that were around this topic here. Um, first of all, there, there are a lot of schools that have individual window units, right? So is there a protocol on that? Are they allowed to turn on the window units? Yes, absolutely. So is, is there anything with regard to filtration and cleaning of the filters? Okay, so the filter is, is freshly changed before the season and it is cleaned periodically by the custodian. And that's the same air conditioning system we've had in place, window units, you know, for as long as I can remember, in buildings that are not central air conditioned. So yes, the window units can be turned on. We actually encourage you to turn them on and there is a clean filter in place. Is there any special protocol regarding changing those filters due to the pandemic? In other words, are they going to be cleaned on a regular basis or they're just cleaned one time and that's it? That, that filter is to filter exterior air that's coming into the building. So you're bringing in clean air. You're bringing in clean air from the outside. So you, they should, it will get dusty after a while. So the custodian will maintain it and they'll clean them and put it back in place. Understood. And, and the, the schools that don't have the window units, um, but the central system, that's going to be on, correct? I'm right. right. Central air systems will be on. Um, and we're upgrading the filterization in the central air system to a MRF 13 filter. 
It's a more efficient filter, and they'll all be in place for opening. Are there any classrooms that will not have air conditioning? Sure, there's, there are existing classrooms across the city that do not have window units nor central air, but they have operating windows. Joe, can I ask a question yes, too? Go ahead. Uh, okay. Hi, um, this is Rashmi. I'm one of the CEC members. So I have a question. Hi. Um, so the schools usually have central air conditioning or they have windows, but there are a lot of schools who have which has old building and has new building attached to it. And new building has central air conditioner, and it's perfect. And the old buildings, they have the windows, but they are sealed in. So in those kind of infrastructure, how like it is better to open a window because that's better. But if you open the window, it takes away from central air conditioning. In those kind of scenarios, what are what is being done? OK, so I want to see if I understand the question um, fully. You have buildings with that are aged buildings that do not have central air. And you're saying these some some of these particular buildings have additions on them that have central air. Is that what right? You're right. Okay. So, the, so the, there's some noise in the background, I'm sorry. So the central air in the new addition, what we would refer to as the new wing, will be running the central air while the uh, old portion of the building either has window units or just has exhaust and blowers operating with operating windows. And there'll be a minimum of two operating windows in each classroom. OK, and that's not going to be in any in terms of electricity, in terms of how much power the central air conditioning, because the buildings are infused. There must be there, there will be a neutral place. I'm not able to understand as a layman person, one side is being central air conditioning, getting filtered and the other side has an open air coming together, infused in one building. Is that how is how you're maintaining the equilibrium between the two sides. It should it should not be an issue. That should not okay. be an issue. You're bringing in fresh air through an intake in, in the side of the building that doesn't have air conditioning, and you're removing it through exhausters. On the okay. air conditioned side, you have conditioned filtered air that you're bringing in, running it through your air conditioning, you're chilling it, and you're creating cold air, and then you're removing that air through return ducts. Okay. Thank so you. some of the concerns with, you know, with the with the air conditioning, the exhaust are deal with the cleaning of the air. I mean, there's there's a lot of questions regarding cleaning protocol and who manages that. Uh, what is the protocol with respect to uh, cleaning? Well, we'll be cleaning the build. We'll be doing a deep cleaning in this building each and every night as we've been doing since the pandemic started in March. As you know, our schools, although they've been closed for the educational purpose, they've been open for many other reasons. They've been open for RECs, they've been open for food hubs, feeding sites, uh, and even some summer camps. So we have been doing deep cleaning in our buildings since the pandemic has uh, you know, surfaced in March. So we will continue to do a deep cleaning every night that the building is occupied. Um, the protocol is during the day, we'll do touch, what they refer to as touch cleaning, um, touch surface cleaning. The custodial staff will be monitoring, walking around the building, wiping down horizontal um, areas, doorknobs, push plates, stair, stair rails, light switches, um faucet handles, drinking fountains. And they'll, they'll be periodically walking the building doing this during the day. And the deep cleaning at night uh, will be done by an electrostatic backpack. And we did a demonstration for CNN about two weeks ago. Um, I'm sure you can find it online. It takes roughly three minutes for us to sanitize a room. This is the same electrostatic backpack that was used in the New York transit system where they shut down the uh, system at one o'clock in the morning and by five o'clock in the morning, the system was sanitized and it was up and running. 
And that will be happening at all the schools, correct? That is correct. It will be happening in every city DOE building. Not only schools, administrative sites, because we've got to make sure that our superintendent is safe as well. Understood. Um, okay. I, I, I don't want to overtake the meeting. Let's just go to another question, Carly. Uh, that's it for, that I got for... Um, uh, on facilities? Unless someone else... There's has one more question in the chat. Someone's asking, someone is asking, will they be cleaning with fresh wipes, rags, and is there going to be an increase in custodial staff? Okay, so let's, that. Thank you, Christine. Let, let's, let's take it one at a time. So you want to know about the cleaning products? You want to know if we're going to be using wipes? All our products are going to be EPA and CDC approved as they are now. We are shipping them out to schools as you, as you speak as we speak and we're stockpiling them in the buildings as well as at the division of school facilities which is vernon boulevard we have a warehouse full of full of product uh and we're ready to go i think Hugh, what they're asking is the they're going to be using wipes that will be thrown away so they're not going to keep using a, a rag and walk through the building using a rag that's kind of what i'm getting out of the question well we have going to we are going to have disinfectant wipes, if that's the answer. Yeah, if that's the question. We will have disinfectant wipes. Okay, so the is facilities providing the PPE to the schools, or is that from another department? Okay, so centrally we are being, um, it is all being handled centrally. It comes to the Division of School Facilities from a central, and then we distribute it across the city of New York to all the buildings. It is so at no cost. It is a, just let me clarify. Sure. This is at no cost to the principal's budget nor the custodian's budget. Can you explain what type of PPE will be provided? Sure. We're going to have surgical masks, gloves, thermometers, disinfectant wipes, hand sanitizer. Uh, disinfectant cleaners, cleaning such as lemon quat, neutral Q, uh, bleach, hand washing soaps. Um, I talked about the electrostatic backpacks that we'll be using. I think I might have covered it. Um, there'll be um, full suits if a custodian has a uh, case in his building where he gets the proper PPE to put on a, um, 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 a full suit to do a disinfecting. If there's an active case, we've done that uh, going back towards since March when we had several uh, cases in our buildings. Um, I'm glad to say that the cases are down to almost none. What about thermometers, plexiglass? Yeah. Okay, so I had mentioned thermometers. I mean, we're providing them, but the custodian is not involved in the taking of the temperature, uh, nor anyone on our maintenance staff is involved in the taking of the temperature. But yes, we will be providing um, the, the thermometers for them, as we have been, again, since March. Since March. And is there any, uh, any room for providing plexiglass within the classrooms? Okay, so what is on, what is being discussed or what's been approved at this point is plexiglass in the general office um, and plexiglass at the security desk. Um, I guess that's where the public comes into the building and has communication with our staff. So that's where the plexiglass at this point is being, um, being placed. So with regard to the cleaning, is there going to be any support to the most most school buildings have one custodian, right? So um, is the custodian going to have enough uh, help to, to clean out and disinfect the school okay, on a daily so basis? Sometimes there's some miscommunication in the terminology of a custodian. So when they say the building has a custodian, the building has a custodian engineer who is in charge of the staff in the building and is a representative of the division of school facilities. So not each and every building has a custodian engineer. Uh, they either have 
one or they have a merged school where they're responsible for a second site. But they have a staff of cleaners and firemen, handymen in the building, depending on the building size. Um, the larger the building, the greater the amount of staff. The smaller the building, of course, the smaller amount of staff. But be mindful. I told you early on that we did a demonstration and we were able to show that in three to four minutes, we're using the electrostatic backpack, we can sanitize a normal size classroom. Is the custodian doing the um, electrostatic? Uh... A member of the custodial staff. Staff, yeah, okay. The, yes. Understood. Okay. So I'm just looking at the chat and maybe, you know, parents are asking if um, all students are going to be provided with masks, correct? And, and teachers, not just the staff, correct? That's um, true. Um, yeah. Okay. And so that's, Joe, that's part of, of my presentation. Understood. Around, okay. Yeah. Um, the other questions I have uh, that I had gotten before regard the social distancing markings, such as uh, markings on the floor where students are supposed to stand or keep six feet apart signs and so and one way signs and whatnot in the hallways. We What's will be providing teacher? all we will be providing all the necessary uh, signage to the custodian uh, that those deliveries have started already and will continue right up until school opening to make sure that every school has a significant amount of signage that's needed to notify everyone where they need to stand, directions on where they need to walk, how to wash your hands, how long to wash your hands. Everything is being shipped out as we speak. So basically they get shipped out to the school and then it's the school's responsibility as to placement of the signs, correct? Right. The, okay. the administration will work hand in hand with the custodian to come up with a plan on how they want it laid out and the custodian will take care of it. And I'm assuming that's inside and outside of the school, correct? I mean, also wherever the signage is needed by the administration, that's where we will put it. Understood. Um, I'm just looking at some comments here that I have. Um, Carly, you'll just piggyback me on the chat. Um, what type of uh, let's see here. Uh, what about the bathrooms? What is the protocol for use, cleaning, and sanitizing, and how often during the day? Okay, so the touch point, the touch point disinfectant that I talked about will continue during the day. As the custodian walks around, the bathroom will be part of their attention, just as water fountains, doorknobs, handrails, everything. The bathrooms will be part of that. At night, we can do the, we do the deep cleaning, just as I spoke about with the electrostatic backpack and we will deep sanitize deep clean every bathroom so there's daytime cleaning as well as the evening cleaning okay uh I'm, is there any protocol with regard to the lunch rooms i'm assuming the students are eating in the classroom correct when you say the lunchroom i'm not sure if the principal will be using the lunchroom at all if not right maybe possibly set up for classes if there's a place, if there's an issue with uh, uh, the amount of classrooms that are available uh, to, to the principal. But uh, I don't think that uh, lunchrooms are slated to be used. Okay. And uh, finally, are there any uh, logs that need to be kept by the custodial staff with regard to the cleaning and uh, what they do are they are they keeping records or is that just something that they're supposed to do it and nobody can monitor it well the custodian is going to they're going to be busy doing sanitizing every day they can they can certainly explain to the custodian where they've been and what they've done but we haven't formatted a log for them to follow or to log into it, it could be a recommendation and we could take it under consideration but we okay. want to spend the time sanitizing and being active and out there and being visible. Everybody be comfortable that we're doing the work that we say we're doing. Understood. So there's a comment here regarding uh, some schools are asking if they can purchase their own plexiglass in terms of uh, in the classrooms or around uh, tables instead of individual desks. Is that something that facilities can help out with or is that something that's going to be just a responsibility of the school? Well, I'd have to kick, I'd have to kick it up, up 
up above and see if um, I can get you an answer on what the department would like to do in reference to plexiglass inside the classrooms. I, I'm okay. not comfortable with answering it because I don't know what their intentions are. I've been told the general office and the security desk is where their plexigla plexiglass is going for, for the start of school. If you have any suggestions, by all means. Okay, so we'll, we'll follow up on that. And uh... Hugh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forward that to uh, Chris Mangero. Okay, fair enough. And then with uh, there's, there's certain questions here regarding testing, right? Uh, is that something, is that something, Danielle, you take, is a yeah, district that's, that's concern? Yeah, that's part okay. of my presentation also, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, is it, will it be possible to use time to replace the faucet and soap dispensers to be touchless? There would not be enough time before school starts for, you know, we, our system is tremendous. Um, you know, 1,700 buildings. It's a lot of classrooms, a lot of sinks, and there would not be enough time to uh, have a, a, an over, overhaul to that extent. Can I, can I ask a question, Joe? Go ahead, Rashmi. Um, so um, who is responsible for providing um, soaps? And uh, I know we talked about de disinfecting everything, but who is responsible for providing soaps in the bathroom for children to actually wash their hands when they're using the bathroom? Which the department? Custodial, the custodial budget is, is uh, formatted in a way where they're responsible for the soap in the bathrooms, yes. Okay. Because okay, this I'm is outside, still... you're asking a question that's outside of COVID. You're saying regular, you know, regular soap that's used on a daily basis. Am I correct? Right, right. right. Yes, that's, I am. That uh, has it... always been part of the custodian's budget and will continue to be part of it. It's not a oh, COVID. Okay. It's not a oh, COVID. Okay. I was I have, not, I'm okay. sorry, this is Monica. I have a question, but what about the consumption of the soap now? It's going to be a lot more than normal. So is that going to be covered also on the budget? If if a custodian needs soap, he can he can send an email to Hugh Dadana and we will provide the soap. We have never run out of soap and we never will. Okay, and what about face shields? Has anybody thought about face shields? Um, I haven't been part of any discussions with face shields. Um, I think it may be something that they're willing to do for adults. I don't know if they would be entertaining that for children. You'd have to make an inquiry. That's part of my presentation too. Okay. okay. <laughs> so uh, this, I'm not sure if this is related to Danielle or to Hugh, but um, with kindergarten and the uh, UPK, there are small kids. They some parents feel the need to have extra clean, you know, cleaning in those classrooms. Um, is there a, a, an opportunity to, to go in during the day and clean them more so than the other classrooms? You know, I, as I said, you know, listen, the, the principals have what they call an annual plan. And that this is a plan uh, that they negotiate with the custodian of their building on how they want their building to be maintained. If they want to, if the principal would like to spend more time in those rooms, they can work that in their plan where something else that was getting done around the building won't get done and they'll pay more attention to those areas. We are, we are open to work with the administration in any way we can um, and that plan is flexible. So, so Hugh and I have um, had conversations about this in the past, and especially now, and I'm going to speak to this uh, during my presentation, that principals will be working with their SLTs, their staff members, their parent communities around a school opening plan, and what uh, the community would would say their needs are. So, so let's just say something instead of painting, right, Hugh, we could say that, you would... Mm -hmm say we would rather that time be used to do um, a second layer of cleaning in the early childhood rooms. So all of those conversations would be held at the school level, and then they would go into the custodial plan that Hugh was discussing. And that's a conversation by, with the principal and the custodian, and then the custodian will say, this is possible, this is not possible, but something that you were mentioning, Joe, is something that would be a possibility, but it would be 
what would we do instead of? Right, that's accurate, very accurate. Okay, so um, just going further on the PPE, uh, are extra paper towels going to be available? Uh, I want everybody to come. Something? We will make everything available. There will be enough chemicals and cleaning supplies for everyone. We are not going to be short. We have, we have plenty of stock. As the custodian needs it, we will be replenishing whatever is needed. We're not shorthanded at all. We have plenty, plenty of product. We've been, we've been stocking for a while. Okay. Um, who is responsible to set up the desks six feet apart? Is that something for Danielle or is that facilities? We work together with the administration okay. to set up the desks. Okay. All right. And I know a lot of parents have been donating some of these supplies to the school, so it's not necessary what you're telling me, right? Um, uh, in terms of the hand sanitizers, the paper towels. Right. We have we have plenty and we will continue to distribute it to all the buildings. OK. And Danielle, I guess you'll answer the question regarding the face shields, if the students could wear them, if the parents. Well, that's something for you to discuss, correct? Yeah. No. Right. Okay. And the white is a huge question. <laughs> and and uh, will the custodian be providing the wipes to disinfect? OK, so we're, I'm going to give wipes to every single classroom across the, the city. So each classroom will have their own set of wipes, but we will be providing it to the custodian as well as the school. OK. OK, I'm not sure if there are any other questions at this time. And if there's something in the chat that we overlooked, uh, Mr. Dodonna, if I send it to you later, would you be able to answer that? Because I don't want to exclude any parents. I know there's a lot of concern out there. I will try to get back to everyone. OK. Hugh, wait, uh, there's, one, there's one question. Um, a parent here in the chat is asking where we purchase the wipes and sanitizers from. I was not involved in the purchasing of it. We have, we have approved vendors that we work through. Um, I honestly don't know, but we have no issue with obtaining product. The city, the Board of Education is a very large entity, and when we go shopping, the vendors are more than happy to oblige us. I, you know, uh, to, to just to kind of echo what he said, last month they asked me for a room to start storing stuff, so they've really been working on it since March to make sure that they, so they asked just me as one person for a room, but they also have schools and and so so they're stocking up. It's coming in. So so to answer to one of the chat, I think Joe already answered that. Um, so is it safe to say that at this point, due to COVID and due to bigger need of disinfectant and wipes and all that stuff, uh, the parents in the past for whichever school we were donating the supplies, you know, we were buying parents were asked to buy as a part of the routine of supplies for and we should not be asking that for now because there is enough stored for the it's not, okay. not necessary. It's not okay. necessary. Okay. Yeah, and if you can if you can get them, call me because I I can't find them for my own house. <laughs> I need it too. <laughs> Give me extra too. <laughs> so no, you wouldn't be required to purchase them. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, this is another recurring question I have is uh, there, there's a lot of concern about air quality. I understand you have those electronic, you know, that that thing that goes on every evening, but is there any air testing that's being done during the day um, in terms of recirculation of air or air purifiers um, uh, put into the classrooms? No, there, there's, there's no, we're not doing any air testing to my knowledge prior to occupancy. We're, we're, we're going to have everything operational as it was designed to do. And we're going to be moving fresh air in and removing it through exhausters. So I have a question. Those schools who are regional centers, till what time they will be regional centers? Because the turnaround time may be just a day or two days, right? I haven't been told when the RECs are, are closing and if they're closing at all. I, I honestly don't know. So what happened to those schools who are RECs? Will they be monitoring a regular school? Like um, now it's con now it's confusing. Like for example, PS24. That's an that's a regional center. So will that not be a regular school in September because regional center will continue? 
that maybe maybe our superintendent can answer that question. I'm I don't sorry, know. I was answering somebody in the chat. What was your question? Oh, so I was wondering uh, with this, uh, the schools that are regional centers, what is the turnaround time between the regional centers being closed and traditional school being started? And then I used the example of PS24 to uh, Mr. Hugh, and he said that we don't, he doesn't know when the regional centers are being closed and traditional school will take over the building. Regional centers are um, functioning all the way up to the beginning of school. So the, I, I believe it's the ninth. Whenever Maybe the, you can, can talk about how the recs are clean now. Yes. They're deep cleaned every day now. Every day. They are. So I think Not, that kind of answers your question. They're, they've been cleaned this entire time. So they'll be clean for when school opens. That's correct. Yeah. OK. OK. Are there any more comments, CEC members? <laughs> OK. Brush me, you have another question? OK. Um, <laughs> so, Mr. Dodona, we thank you for your time. Uh, that my absolute pleasure. Thank you, and Mr. We, we hope that everything works out the way it's supposed to, and we have our fingers crossed. Okay. Um, of course, if we have any recommendations or questions, we'll follow up with you, and we appreciate, you know, if, if you um, can uh, assist us with those questions. We will. Um, no problem. So, Everyone have a great evening, and thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Mr. Dodonna. Oh, it's a pleasure you to see you. And, and, and I want to thank your, I'm sorry, I just had a fly. <laughs> I want to thank you and your custodians for all the work that they've been doing um, this summer. And I know that you and I have spoken often and I have confidence in the work that um, is happening in District 25 through the custodians. So, so thank you for that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll share your kind words. Everyone have a good night. You Bye too. Now. Thanks again. Thank you. Um, so it only makes sense to go on to the uh, superintendent's portion of the meeting, which uh, we can answer a lot of other questions. But Danielle, you want to start with your report, and then we'll take it from there. Yes. So I'm I'm going to do um, a presentation that may answer a lot of questions that have already been placed in the chat, and then um, there will also be an opportunity for you to ask further questions. Um, both via the chat, and then I would also um, uh, open up for any public questions um, that parents have. So before I um, start speaking just in terms of general health and safety protocols that are coming out of uh, the Department of Education that are going to be implemented and monitored system-wide, I do want to talk about the importance of communicating with the principals in District 25, because the the overall all safety protocols that will be adhered to may look and sound a little bit different in individual schools, just in terms of the makeup of the, the, the physical plant of the building or the needs that are communicated through uh, the health and safety and the, the, the response teams of the schools. So, so I will answer overall general questions, but some of them, it's important that you are um, reading the, the communications that are coming out from your school and that you're logging into the school's um, town hall meetings and any further meetings that they will be having to update you on health and safety schedules and, and general protocols. So, so like I had said, I will uh, give you the, the generalized view, but your principal and, and school-wide SLT will be able to give you a more specific school-based view as well. I wanna thank all the principals that are on today. Um, there are many of them that we have been meeting with consistently and supporting each other to ensure that our schools are ready to open. I know that there was a question around the September date that Mr. Dodonna had mentioned. That is our target date, but as you know from listening to the news, the mayor, we're still waiting for the, the final answer from the governor, and then 
The mayor had said that he will provide further guidance towards the end of August as to the official start date of New York City schools. So as we said, that's that's the projected date, but please make sure that you are uh, listening to the updates or logging into the DOE website, which I will list at the end of this presentation to make sure you're getting the most up-to-date information regarding uh, school opening. Okay, so here we go, Lewis. So as you have, know, have, have heard from the governor, there are certain thresholds that um, he has put in place for opening and closing schools. The DOE's thresholds are more strict and stringent just in terms of uh, expectations for schools opening and closing. So in order for all schools to reopen in New York City, we must meet the following. The percent of positive tests in New York City overall is less than 3% using a seven day rolling average. And if we cross this threshold, we will not open. And the threshold for closing schools is the percent of positive tests in New York City equal to or greater than 3% using a seven day rolling average. And if we cross this threshold, we will close. Next slide. Oh, wait. I know, Lewis, you want me, you wanted to me to say thank you. Um, so we know that we have exceeded the seven day threshold where we have been below 3% using a seven day rolling average. So if we remain on that projection, we will be opening. Okay, now next slide. Thank you for the pause. So you heard a little bit from Mr. Dodonna just in terms of building preparations that are happening prior to schools reopening. Um, it just in terms of changing filters and air conditioning at the start of the school year, the DOE will provide all schools with the necessarily su supplies to help protect students and staff, including hand sanitizers, soaps, disinfectant, and thermometers. The DOE will make um, a maximum number, number of sinks available for hand washing, and there will also be um, hand sanitizer stations in large public areas. Um, and the DOE will increase cleaning throughout the day with special attention to high touch areas. And going back to um, what Mr. De, De Benedetto was talking about, if the school would see a high touch area as being certain classrooms, certain areas of the school, that is a conversation that um, the principal would have with the custodian in terms of the daily and nightly plan for cleaning. So food services. Um, as you may have heard, all meals, both breakfast and lunch, will be grab and go every day. And doing so will allow for more flexibility so students and physical distancing can be maintained during lunchtime and a time when many students usually gather in one location. Students will be permitted to bring their own lunch if preferred. Lunch will be in classrooms to minimize interaction between groups of students. If the cafeteria must be used, schools will maintain appropriate physical distancing. Grab and go meals will be delivered to students in 3K and K classrooms and pickup points within the school will be designated for grades one through eight and brought to classroom. Um, so Mr. Zhu, no hot lunch right now uh, at this time. Um, additionally, grab and go meals for breakfast and lunch will also be available to our fully remote students. Um, and you will hear more from your schools about when pickup of those meals will be um, held and, and the time frames that students can come and get them. Okay. So keeping students safe requires the physical environment, uh, that the physical environment where our staff works and our students learn must be modified to meet current health and safety needs. And as many of you have heard from our district town hall meetings led by our principals. They have spoken to you about, um, and I spoke about uh, during our last meeting, the past survey and additional surveys that Central has provided our principals with that talk about the maximum capacity in terms of um, safe and social distancing needs that, um, that will designate how many um, staff and student members can safely be within each individual classroom or open space in every school. So all of that information has gone out to schools. They have presented it to their SLTs and have also presented it to families during the, ta the town hall meetings that have been held over the past month. 
Okay, next slide. All right. So schools will be allowed in some cases to modify or reconfigure spaces to ensure compliance with physical distancing distancing rules. That would include the use of cafeterias for instructional space if needed, the use of um, auditoriums for instructional space if needed, and any other spaces such as dance rooms or art rooms. Additional guidance on the process for space modification um, will be shared later this summer. All schools have designated isolation rooms, and I will speak a little bit more to that um, as as we go further in talking about health and safety. And these are rooms where students who are, or staff members who are exhibiting symptoms will be brought to for um, isolation prior to them exiting the building, um, as well as staff to supervise that space. Next. Okay, schools will need to implement enhanced cleaning and disinfection of surfaces to ensure the health and safety of staff and students. Our custodians have been um, briefed as you have seen through Mr. Dodonna just around those processes. Um, we will be receiving actual um, guidelines which school principals will be sharing with their communities. Throughout the year, the DOE will continue the rigorous practices used to prepare buildings for reopening, including cleaning and disinfection supplies um, and plans to um, monitor and pro procure those supplies requiring deep cleanings to be completed on a nightly basis, including the use of electrostatic sprayers, which Mr. Dodonna had spoken about, improving HVAC systems to ensure proper ventilation, and that is happening as um, during this month as we speak, um, and principals have been made aware of improvements to their HVAC systems if they're being made at that time, so that is questions that you can ask them. Setting up enhanced cleaning in classrooms, bathrooms, and for high-touch areas such as doorknobs, and shared equipment such as laptops and providing teachers with cleaning supplies for classrooms. Um, so screening entry dismissal protocols. So in order to maximize the number of individuals who come in contact with each other and in order to identify potentially six students and staff, schools will be required to follow all applicable health guidance and to develop entry and dismissal protocols consistent with the latest health guidance, including staying up to date on guidance, guidance on symptom checks, which continues to evolve. What I do know is um, there, there is a self screener. I took one today um, where you log in and you are supposed to, um, to speak about if you've had a temperature, if you've been around anyone with COVID symptoms and you get um, a response and uh, uh, entry pass into buildings, and that is for all staff. We do ask and we'll be asking parents to check students' um, uh, students' temperatures before they come into the building. And we will also be doing random temperature checks. And visitors that come daily will be, um, uh, we will ask and speak to them about our safety protocols regarding symptoms. Um, there's going to be guidelines for health screenings of staff. Um, who report to work outside of morning arrival and managing student drop off and pick up outside school buildings to minimize the number of external visitors. So one of the things that we have said, it's strongly recommended that all non-essential visitors do not enter the school buildings. Schools will limit the frequency and duration of visitors. If you go to pick up your child, just know that you will have to meet your child at the front desk. You will not be gaining entry um, into the main office as what used to be. And the only parents who will be permitted to the into the school building are our pre-K parents who during the first month of school will be bringing their students to their classroom and dropping them off. And that is only for the first month of school. Additionally, we have advised principals because we do have parents asking for face-to-face -face meetings. Um, what we are saying and supporting is that if at all possible, all of these meetings should occur on the phone via Teams um, to prevent a, a, to prevent the, the, a large number of people from entering the school buildings. Okay. Um, similarly, schools must redesign building movement protocols, and you heard Mr. Dodonna talk about the signage that's going to go around the school, but it's keeping students and groups of people in cohorts and allowing for phys uh, physical distancing consistently. So students will be scheduled with staff members in pods where they will be with each other all day. 
which will allow us for tracing protocols if a student or staff member tests positive for COVID-19. Um, schools are being required to the extent feasible to redesign movement protocols within building to minimize congestion um, and what that can and should look like at arrival, dismissal, if students are leaving classrooms, designate one-way direction stairwells and single file routes. Many of our schools already have those and students do have an understanding of how they work. Address elevator usage policies. There will be strict guidelines around one person in an elevator at a time. Um, and signage will be provided to support appropriate movement protocols. So not maybe, but it will be. So next is testing and tracing. So the city is going to continue to closely monitor health conditions. And if community transmission begins to rise across the boroughs, the decisions to close all schools may be included in the mitigation efforts. In the interest of the health and safety of our entire city, the Department of Health recommends that all New Yorkers get tested, whether or not you have symptoms or at an increased risk. All staff members will be asked to take a COVID-19 test in the days before the first day of school. They are not manda mandatory, but they are free. School staff will have priority ac uh, access for testing in 34 city run testing locations with tests provided free of charge with expedited results. And this testing is also available to families citywide, but it is not uh, mandatory. So testing and tracing. If someone in the community feels sick, um, if a student or teacher is feeling sick, they are asked and required to stay home. Please do not send your students to school if they are sick. And we are also saying to teachers, if you do not feel well and you are sick, you should stay home. If their systems are consistent with COVID-19, they are asked to get tested. If a student is experiencing symptoms in school, they will be isolated in the isolation room and monitored by a dedicated staff member until they're picked up by their family. Staff members who become symptomatic at school are asked to leave the building. Um, whether symptoms begin at home or in school, there will be a clear flow of information to facilitate fast action and prevent spread. A positive confirmed case will trigger an investigation by the New York City Test and Trace and Department of Health to determine close contacts within the schools. Schools will communicate to all families and students at school once a case is laboratory confirmed. In the event that there is a laboratory confirmed case in a school, all students and teachers in that class are assumed close contact and will be instructed to self-quarantine for 14 days since their last exposure to that case. Additionally, the Department of Health and Test and Trace Corps will begin an investigation into the risk of exposure to the school community and will work with the DOE to issue clear guidance and decisions and next steps based on that outcome. So here are some scenarios in terms of um, post-investigation decisions on classroom quarantines. So if you have one confirmed case, during the investigation, the classroom is closed classroom room and if the post investigation if it is a verified case the classroom remains closed for 14 days students and staff in close contact with positive case self quarantine for 14 days if there are at least two cases linked together in the same classroom classrooms closed um, and remains closed for 14 days and students and staff in close contact with positive cases self quarantine for 14 days um, if at least two cases are linked together in a school in different classrooms, during the investigation, the school is closed and classrooms of each case remain closed and quarantined. Additional school members are quarantined based on where the exposure was in the school. And at least two cases linked together by circumstances outside the school, um, acquired infection by a different setting, such as a party or source. Um, once again, the school is closed and the school opens post-investigation classrooms remain closed for 14 days. Now, these are just some examples that um, the, the tracing that will happen with the schools. So, but what you will see here is that there will be a close connection between individual school principals, the Department of Health and the Test and Trace Corps. So the last one is at least two cases not linked, but exposure confirmed for at least each one outside of the school setting. 
once again, the school is closed and post investigation, the school will reopen post investigation. The classroom will remain closed um, for 14 days. If the link is unable to be determined, once again, school is closed and the school will close for 14 days. So it is not going to be a building principal or a building nurse that will do this investigation. These are test and trace professionals that work very closely with the Department of Health and advise schools as to the next steps that need to be taken. Um, whenever a student is quarantining, quarantining at home, the expectation is that they continue engaging in learning remotely if they're feeling well enough. If the school is closed, the principal will communicate by 6 p.m. on the night before about the status of opening the next morning and based on the status of the investigation. We will not reopen a school building without confirmation from public health experts that it is safe. I think it's just important just to remind everyone that just because our buildings or our classroom closes, the learning does not stop. Students will be learning five days a week and uh, they will just move to remote learning if their classroom is uh, quarantined or if the school is closed. All right, so personal health measures. So we will promote behaviors that reduce the spread of COVID, which is physical distancing. All individual and school buildings should remain at least six feet apart and we'll work with schools to create conditions that make physical uh, distancing possible. Uh, face coverings. Face coverings will be required inside school buildings. Exceptions will be developmentally, developmentally and age appropriate, consistent with guidance of health agencies and paired with increased uh, PPE for staff. New York City Department of Education is uh, procuring and distributing appropriate PPE for students and staff to use when inside school buildings. So um, if you choose to send your child to school with a mask, um, that is uh, that is appropriate for you, that you think is, is best for your child, um, you may do that. But if a child comes to school without a mask, one will be provided for them. Uh, hand washing and hand sanitizing. There will be increased access and regular opportunities for students and staff to wash hands or use hand sanitizer stations throughout the day. And signage and floor markings, which we had spoke about. So schools will have signage that upholds New York City Health and four core actions of prevention, as well as um, what Mr. Dodonna was talking about, the uh, front entrance school safety desk, as well as the main office will also have um, plexiglass uh, as, as another safety measure. So um, I see a lot of you are asking if this is um, going to be shared. Yes, this is a, a public presentation and it will be shared, but we do include the return to school uh, link here that will give you regular updates from, from the DOE. And there are also family and student information sessions that are held with uh, Chancellor Carranza. The next one is Wednesday, August 12th from 6.30 to 8, and Thursday, August 27th from 6.30 to 8. Um, as you have all known that we had spoke about at the last meeting and our principals were talking about at town halls, uh, we do ask that you fill out your learning preference survey by August 7th. The learning preference survey is where parents are asked to choose to do a blended model, which will be sometimes spent in a school building and sometimes uh, at home, or a fully remote model where students will be fully remote five days a week. So, and this, uh, pres this presentation is already available on the CEC's website if you click on the meeting documents, you can find this PDF on there as well. I just have a question for clarification on that, sure. um, the um, remote learning. So yeah. if parents do not submit their surveys by August 7th, it's a presumed that they're going to opt for the blended learning, correct? Yes, the default so is blended learning. And the reason for that, and we had spoken about this uh, at our last meeting, is that you leave blended learning at any time and go fully remote. So if let's say you select blended learning and school starts and you say, I want my child to go fully remote, you contact your child's school, you let them know you can go fully remote at any time. 
what parents need to know is you cannot come out of fully remote um, until the end of the first quarter, which they're saying will be sometime at the end of October, early November. And that is because of scheduling of the school. So we cannot have um, large groups of students wanting to come back into school because it could impact social. So that is why if you do not complete it, the default would be fully remote. And then, I mean, the default will be blended and you can contact your school. So that's a firm deadline. If a parent submits their uh, their survey on August 8th or the, or the 10th, what's going to happen? It's just going to make the classroom smaller because they're not going to fill up the classroom with any other students, correct? Well, what we do know is every student that decides to go blended learning will have a seat in their zone school or the school that they're currently in. Um, at, or a school that they were accepted in, let's say, if, if you were part of the middle school choice. But um, so, so everyone that chooses to go blended will have a seat. The difference is, and, and so this is why you'll hear at some of our town hall meetings, principals talk about different models of options. So SLTs were asked to work with uh, our school building principals and um, well, the chapter lead is part of the SLT and the PTA president is also uh, part of the SLT to select a model that best fits the needs of their school. But they were also asked to select um, a different model based on um, the current needs of the school and uh, the needs that may in, that may change based on how many students opt into blended learning or remote learning. So, for example, Many of our schools, and, and I'm actually going through this now, have chosen model 1A or 1B. I know that some of you have done that. Um, based on population, some of them have chosen model two, right? So model two is where you need to have three groups um, instead of two in terms of blended. Um, and so a model two may be the preferred model right now, but if less students come to school and more students are remote, that one school that was model two may be able to go model 1A and 1B. And that would just increase the amount of time that students um, have an opportunity to spend within the building. Okay. Okay. So you can ask me any questions that I may not okay, have answered. So we, we have a bunch of questions in the chat. We also had some preliminary questions that were submitted. I'd like to start with the preliminary questions and then we'll go to the chat. And then we'll continue from there. All right, Carly, do you have the questions? Yeah. Second. Sorry. Um, will the teachers and anyone else who has contact be mandated to get COVID tested? I think she answered that. There are teachers who live in my area who do not practice social distancing or wearing masks. Um, I guess they want to know how will you monitor their traveling and will they have to disclose their destination and quarantine for 14 days? So um, I don't monitor uh, traveling of staff, but we have communicated as a system. Um, if you are traveling outside of New York and to a state or, um, or, or other country that has had an uptick in cases and therefore are part of our quarantine list, we ask everyone to follow the guidelines of quarantine before returning to work. Okay. Um. Another question was, when can I submit the survey for going back to school or not? But you also answered that. Um, so the, the learning preference survey is open now and it closes on Friday, August 7th. And it only needs to be completed by families who are choosing to go fully remote learning in September. Next one. Okay. I think so, yeah. Okay. What does the job of a cluster teacher look like in the new norm? Will notebooks, papers, and pencils be provided to the students, and will teachers be allowed to collect paper or notebooks? Will all assessments be online? And what if there's not enough computers for each student? And are there charging stations being um, designed within the classroom? And how will laboratory science equipment be shared and reused? So all of those questions are really good questions that should be asked at the school level because each school will may have different answers to what that can and should look like for their schools in terms of um, uh, charging stations, the requirements and use of 
uh, technology equipment during the school day. Um, so as I had said earlier on in the meeting is that schools will now engage in opening planning meetings that will be happening with their SLTs, their school custodians, and speaking about things such as this in terms of how we're going to organize to continue to ensure health and safety um, within the school beyond the guidelines that are presented um, for health and safety in general. So questions about what it will look like within a classroom, how school supplies will be maintained and managed to, to ensure that only one child is using their school supplies will all come from individual schools. Okay. And the question about teacher scheduling is that's also the principal will be programming the school. So it's a school, school level uh, conversation. Right, so many of our principals are waiting for two things. They're waiting for the results of the um, the parent survey. Right. As their select. So if you have not done that, please get that in as soon as possible. Um, and they're also waiting for staff members that may have applied for accommodations. To so once that happens, they're going to look at the staff that they have on who will be teaching remotely, who will be teaching in school, and they will start to form their programs. And then they will begin communicating with you about, um, uh, number one, what the, the school day will look like, what curriculum will look like, what expectations will look like. And then they will also be communicating around questions that, that are being asked around supplies um, and, and uh, the way schools will be run to ensure the health and safety, such as arrivals, dismissals, um, and, and school movement throughout the building. So there's lots of questions about uh, class size. So I just want the, you know, the, the parents to understand it's school-based decision, correct? Yes. So, so for in-school class size, are they talking about? In-school class size goes yes. by the past survey that we talked about. Um, and it also goes by the most updated survey that your principal and SLT will have access to. And that lets each school know by the, the makeup of their building and the square footage of each classroom, how many students and staff members can safely fit into um, each of those rooms. And principals are asked to make passes aligned to those safety measures. And what about parents that work um, Working parents, like they remote learning, can they? Can they, can they, can they call it. There's an echo. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. I think somebody has a thing. Um. Working parents, will they be able to do help the children with the classwork to submit the the, the, the work after the school after the school day is over? So once again, yes, we we know that even during our first wave of remote learning, that there was a tremendous amount of flexibility and communication between um, parents and teachers and parents and principals of the needs of the students. But we've heard both sides. So what we also know is if you are fully remote, there will be live instruction every day and opportunities for students to engage who, who do miss that work, opportunities for students to engage in online videos and other support work. But there will be somewhat of a schedule because although we did have parents that say, I work and can only do this work with my students at certain times, we also had um, parents asking for schedules of synchronous learning, live learning. Um, what I also know, and I've spent a lot of time in our summer school classrooms, which are very schedule based and students really do enjoy the mimicking of a virtual school day. So in my interviews with students, one student said to me, I like knowing that I have to log in at 8.30. So from 8.30 to 9.15, I have a class. And then I do some work until 10.15 when I have another class. So students are following a schedule that does mimic an in-school schedule. So, so there will be flexibility. And it is advised by me that you do communicate with your child's teacher and your child's guidance counselor and assistant principal or principal that they might be in need for whatever you decide, albeit blended learning and your child is home remotely for a certain amount of days and will need um, some flexibility in their time to get assignments in or if you choose to go fully remote.
Are there any other questions that you have, Carly? <laughs> Not from the previous comments. Now it's just from the chat. Okay, so I'm going to go towards the beginning of the chat, Danielle, if you don't mind. Um, I'm going to just start from the top and we'll go down. I apologize if I miss anybody. Uh, we'll try to cover all your questions. Um, just a comment, which was more for facilities perhaps, but if schools want to purchase their own air purifiers or these plexiglass uh dividers are they going to be allowed to do that is that so that is a question that i just had said to um, mr dodonna that i'm going to forward to space planning to see about the guidance around that okay uh next question here are kids going to have a full day of school on the days when they when the building has in school classes or is it half days then cluster classes at home and then are there after school aftercare programs so, um, so Lewis, I know that we talked about this today. This the hours yep. for in school is five hours and what? Um, I have to check. Yes, we have to double check. But but students yeah, five hours and 30, 30 minutes. Thirty minutes. Yes, yeah, that's what I want. five hours and thirty minutes. So that is the school day for students, and that will encompass. Um, uh, working with in your core classes and also any cluster uh, classes that you have as well. Okay, um, just reading down here. Uh, a lot of questions about filters. Fred, okay, that's okay. Um, so, um, So is September 10th, well, we already know, but is that a definite start date? Uh, no, so that is a projected start date. But once again, we had said we're waiting to hear some final words from the governor around our plan approval and then from the mayor, which he had said would happen the end of August, beginning of September. Will there be outdoor recess time and will the kids be allowed to play on the school playground? So we talked about this today with principals and outdoor recess has to be planned extremely strategically because remember I had spoken in advance about students staying in pods. So if there is outdoor recess, students cannot mix with each other by classes. They have to remain in the classes to allow for tracing purposes. So um, Yes, there can be outdoor recess, but once again, how that is going to be organized to maintain social distancing and to maintain the organization of students in pods is better communicated by the principal who will be um, organizing and arranging for school recess. So again, school by school, correct? But yes, but there will be opportunities provided for recess. What exactly it would look like um, will come from the school. Perfect. Now, do the full remote students have a schedule as well? Well, they will. Okay. And Joe, I have a question. This is Monica. Hi, Monica. Hi. Uh, what about the after school program? Are the schools still going to coordinate with the after school program? You know how they normally pick them up and everything? So we have asked for further guidance regarding after school programs because remember when we spoke about in pods, one of the concerns that I am waiting for further guidance on is um, if we organize students in pods and maintain social distancing for tracing purposes and then mix them up in the after school program, we've kind of negated the purpose for organizing in that way. So we have asked for guidance in what that can and should look like in after school programs. What we also know is after school programs have to commit to the same guidelines that we are asking our schools to commit to and they must also provide PPE. So I will um, get back to you around that. Our principals have asked about that, um, but the number one piece that we should be thinking about as parents is can we maintain that, um, you know, the, the work of tracing and keeping students organized in a, in a similar way um, during after school and throughout the school day, and that's the struggle. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we already answered that kids are eating lunch in the classroom, correct? But in, in so now the question is 
regarding perhaps like in the middle schools. Are the, are the students transferring classes or rooms during the day or are they just staying in one room? We want as little movement as possible. Um, and in, in terms of allowing for that, it will be teachers moving rooms and not students. Um, okay, we already discussed the custodial staff. Will there be any contact testing at the school to screen asymptomatic people who are COVID-19 positive? No, we will not be doing testing of, um, we will be doing random screenings, but not testing. So is the screen. random screening on just the staff or does it include students? Well, the screening, um, the screening that we have to do to check in every day is done by staff. And what comes is like an admission ticket to get into schools that, that should be checked to say that you've done your screening. Um, the random screening of students, uh, we have not got full uh, guidance on what that is, but we do know that it does include a temperature. So, okay. But there will not be testing at the schools. And just relate, I saw this later on, but um, so the, the staff testing is not mandatory and why? In other words, it, it's why why a parent had asked why can't they make it mandatory? I don't, I, you know what I, I would ask why, but it, as of right now, it's not. Okay. So we discussed about the plexiglass, the vendors. Um, for full remote learning, will the teachers allow kids to ask questions and provide one-on-one -on -one assistance to the child? should they need additional support? Yes, and the, you know, the good part of a lot of the questions that parents were asking prior to this is our full remote teachers will also be supported and supervised by our building supervisors. So the remote blended in-school teaching staff will continue to maintain the same expectations around curriculum and instruction there is also centrally, which will be released to um, principals next week so they can begin to organize and plan within the units of study, power standards, key standards that within each unit of study, um, teachers, wherever they are, albeit remote, um, blended, that they have to um, make sure that these standards are taught and properly assessed. And when you're focusing in on something like that within a unit of study, it does allow you to assess students along the way and provide small group instruction and supports for students um, that do need it, but also to create opportunities for extensions as well for our high performing learners. And there will also be time in the in the day for teachers to talk with parents. Uh, if parents have questions or need help, they, they that time will be also there. Jill, can I ask a question? Sure. Go ahead. It, it just piggybacks uh, Danielle's uh, statement. So the chances letter that kind of blanket black and white states the fact that all remote learning, they will try our best for the teachers to be from the same school. Um, how realistic is that to apply in practical sense? Because a lot of school community parents have not filled up their survey yet. So what happens if a school is 60-40 flips to 40-60? It becomes more remote than blended. So how, like, the parents are very concerned about not understanding what's going to happen with the 100% remote learners. Like, who is teaching them? What, who is supervising them? Uh, what is the grading policy? And all the questions concerning after that. So I, so I want to be clear in, in something that we had talked about and, and something that the chancellor was very clear on too, that remote or blended learning opportunities are happening um, and monitored through the building principal. So one of the things that I can uh, talk about, and I, we just had this conversation um, today with our principals, that we have done very well in District 25, is our work with teaching and learning and curriculum and instruction. Um, our, our principals are instructional leaders and we value that. Um, they work together consistently to ensure that units of studies are rigorous and target the needs of individual students. We have for years spoken about um, how 
uh, our teacher teams have worked really well together in terms of gaining an understanding of the curriculum in their school and actually aligning and uh, redeveloping units of study to meet the specific needs of the students in each, each one of our schools. Our teachers have worked together in both grade bands, they worked in content levels and individual grade levels. They have um, wonderful collegial relationships. So one of the things that we talked about today is if I'm a remote learner, I mean, if I'm a remote teacher and Lewis is um, a brick and mortar teacher, there can still be that teaming and that collaboration that is scheduled by the principal that we are working within a unit of study that we have a clear understanding of. Because one of the things that has happened from that work is that, and you, and you will see this from your conversation with many of our teachers, is they are also content and curricular and instructional specialists in the work that they've been doing in their schools. So, so a full remote learner, will a full remote teacher and learner will be learning the same standards and doing the same work within a unit of study within a, a in the same way as in a blended. If you have a teacher that's teaching a lesson in the brick and mortar building and another teacher that is doing the at home part of the blended learning, principals will ensure that that teaming continues where I would say to Lewis, you know, today on Wednesday, I'm going to finish this. Can you make sure that you pick up on this task, work the students through this task? And the objective of that is next Tuesday when they come back to me, that work is done so I can collect that and go over that. They will be reviewing and assessing student work together and planning together. So that is something that we are working through um, to ensure that there is consistency no matter what learning option parents are selecting. I, I think something else that helps uh, answer Rosmi's question is if a, in the event that a large number of students decide to go remote learning only, uh, there's there's nothing stopping a teacher in the school from being that remote teacher. Doesn't only have to be teachers that are working at home. Right. So teachers can be in the school building, and one one part of the day are teaching a group of remote students. Uh, so th it's it's not like it's only teachers that are at home can teach remote learning. Okay. And I think yeah, that kind yeah. of answers your questions a little bit too. Yeah, that's a that's a great clarification because that just helps understand these the detail that you guys are working on. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Trying to move it along here. So I know that we we there are after school programs that may continue to operate, but will the after school programs still be permitted to pick up students from schools? Yeah, the, the, we are asking that and we know that District 25 and District 26 are very different than other communities in that we do have that and that is a concern. So you'll have a student picked up from PS22 and brought to PS20. So we have asked that question and we're getting further guidance and feedback on what that can and should look like. Perfect, thank you. So the next question regards the isolation room. So if a child or a teacher has positive symptoms or a case of COVID, will they be isolated from everyone else? And who's to say in the isolation room, are you gonna be separating those kids that have COVID symptoms as opposed to other issues like stomach issues or whatever? So that is going to be evaluated by our school nurse and the, the school health and safety um, supports at the school um, and, and students that are exhibiting symptoms that are similar to COVID such as a fever, um, right. they will be placed in an isolation room. So yes, if your child has a fever, but does it necessarily have COVID, they will, be played, they will be isolated with a fever. Yeah, so will they be in the same room with the other, in other words, are they gonna be separated? What's the procedure there? Yes, they, you, they will still maintain the social distancing with the mask wearing and yes. Okay, so children that have get like a paper cut aren't gonna go into the isolation room. If you get, right, if you get hurt. But if they have a cough, if they have the a fever. You will not go in the isolation room. Right, exactly. So it has does, to be COVID-19 symptoms. Understood. But does the student go to the nurse's office or does the nurse go to the isolation room? Because then you have to worry about contamination. What? See, once again, that's a school level question about what do the nurse's offices look like, right? So we have some nurses nurses office that look like doctor's offices, right? You have a sick area, a well area, and then you have some nurses offices that don't. So although that's a good question, that is a school based question. School -based. Okay. But what we do know is in general, that students who exhibit COVID-19 symptoms need to go to the isolation room 
and they would be separate from some other cases like we had just mentioned. Thank you. So now who is responsible to set up this, the desk six feet apart and who's responsible for monitoring the, the bathrooms to make sure that the students are six feet apart? Is that also school by school or is there something from central for the, the district? That's school by school, but as you heard Mr. Dodonna say that custodians are working very closely with uh, school principals to make sure that the classrooms are set up. Um, and I know that there was a question also about signage. Yes, there will be signage in individual classrooms. Um, and uh, in terms of bathrooms, once again, that is a school-based question, but the guidance for principals is that you still need to maintain social distancing protocols within your school bathrooms, which means you have to know who's in there. Mm -hmm. So whatever that will look like is a school-based decision. Understood. Do you have extra support for 100% remote learning programs, especially, especially in special education? Yes, so we've been talking a lot about what this looks like, what we can assure parents and parents of students with IEPs that all their IEP needs will be met. We do encourage parents to make sure that they're part of that conversation and the differences about what remote learning um, can and should look like for their child. Um, you know, you are the ones that are home with your children. I'm home with my own children. I see what their needs are in terms of remote learning. So make sure that right away, as soon as school begins, if you choose to go full remote, that you're connecting with your school's guidance counselor and your team, the SBST team, and, and you're having that conversation about what the individual needs of your students are and what that looks like um, within your child's IEP. Okay. Uh, when do the schedules come out? School-based, you know, that is a question that you should be asking your principals, but I can tell you the programming has not started yet in many schools. We have been talking about ideas and what that can and should look like under the current guidelines, but we do need to know um, how many parents have filled out that survey, who's going fully remote, who's going blended, and the accommodations. Okay. I know you answered questions regarding the face mask, but if parents buy face shields for their for their children, can they wear them during class hours? So we will get further guidance on face shields, but to my understanding, a face shield does not replace a mask. So. But if a parent say, wants to send their, their child to school with oh, a mask and the shield? shield we'll get guidance on that. Your principal will be able to tell you that because that's a question that's been asked before. Okay, but it's not an option of just coming in with a, a mask and I mean a, a shield and not a mask, correct? Understanding shields do not replace masks. You need to, uh, yes. Yeah, face covering is different. Okay. Um, so someone, to, to piggybacking on the mask, someone asked everyone who enters the school building should wear a mask. And I think Danielle, you said, um, it had to be age appropriate and developmentally appropriate. They wanted to like expand on that. What did that mean? What's so, so if your child, one of the things that we've recommended to parents is if your child is uncomfortable wearing a mask to maybe start now practicing with them wearing masks. So we've seen some, you know, children who kind of get lost in a TV show or on their iPads to have them wear the mask to practice, to talk about, you know, when we go to school, you're, you're going to need to wear this just so so everyone is safe. Um, if your child has difficulty in a younger age wearing a mask or um, another reason that you would want to bring up to your um, school principal, you can be you can feel free to do that. So I can't, ex you know, give individual instances. But what I can say is as a parent, if you don't want your child to wear a mask in school because you're not you're against mask wearing. Um, just know that it is a requirement to wear masks in school, and that may guide you to a, a decision that you're making to either be blended or fully remote. So as of right now, masks are required in the school building. Any kind of exceptions should be discussed with your school principal so they can be escalated and reviewed, but um, masks will be required. You can't say, I'm sending my child to school and they're not wearing a mask. They will be given a mask and expected to wear it. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to move along here. What happens with cluster classes and speech, OT, and counseling? So any, the, kind uh, service, any kind of mandated services will be provided. Um, 
you would have to hear more from your school about how that will be provided. That's they, part of they may be provided remotely or they can be provided in person, depending on the teacher's program and the child's uh, learning preference for the for the child. OK, is there any procedure for requiring parents to report if their child has symptoms? Um, one thing this parents concerned about, what if parents send their kids to school regardless because the parents need to go to work? So where's the extra precaution, you know, for the other students? So, so, so that's where we talk about, you know, we are a community. And, you know, unfortunately, we are in a terrible pandemic and we're going to have to work together. Um, so we know that, um, you know, child care is an issue around this pandemic and we are trying our best mm -hmm. what they're saying? we're waiting for your guidance from the mayor i know that that there is some discussions about providing child care when necessary but we do need to work together and just know that you cannot send your child to school if they are sick because you doing that can cause the school to be closed and then you can't send your child to school anyway so, so we do really need to work together to ensure our student safety, to ensure staff safety. You know, one of the things in, in my own uh, children's school that the, the concern about masks, we, we said we do know that masks do prevent the spread of the virus. And if our teachers get sick, then we don't have anybody to teach our kids. So we all have to work together to make sure that if our children are sick, they cannot come to school. If your child is sick and has a fever, they go into, you know, we go into one of these protocols and contact tracing models anyway. So your child may be asked to stay home for 14 days. So, so these are things that we do need to, to kind of work together to ensure the safety for everyone. Understood. What staff member is responsible for monitoring the isolation room? So that is, that will be communicated to you from your school principal. Okay, um, moving along. Um, more questions than Hugh did. <laughs> What's that? I said I'm getting more questions than Hugh did. Just a few. <laughs> um, so will there be floor markings within each classroom? I think you already yeah. answered that, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so will the kids need to bring in laptops to class for hybrid learning? Once again, that's a, a, a school-based question. But technology will be provided to students. I think you already asked about, we answered about the age developmentally appropriate uh, so, guidelines. Yes. Um, so on the chat, one of the questions is, has there been an update on how teaching staff will be supplemented to accommodate the remote learners, Group D? Um, has there been a survey of schools to see how many additional teachers are needed? So we had that conversation today as well. Once our principals get the information around the number of students being blended in remote and the number of t uh, teachers asking for accommodations and they begin to start their programming, they will be communicating to me and to Central around the number of teachers that will be needed. Either way, if there are teachers that are assigned to a school, they will still be monitored and supervised by the school principal and the school administration. So the expectations for that teachers and the training and supports to make sure that they are that they have a clear understanding of um, what the needs are within the curriculum, the standards will all be provided by the school. Okay. Are schools being instructed to prepare a plan for all students to go remote when an outbreak occurs at the school? And what is the district doing for 100% remote? So I, I think I, I address that in general because what we're looking at are units of study, right? So units of study are going to be supported and managed in the blended model through the, the work with teachers within classrooms and remote, um, but there will be uh, similar, uh, actually the same expectations within a unit of study um, with full remote. The difference comes about, and something that we are working very hard to support our teachers with, in um, ways to engage students when you are fully remote and in a brick and mortar setting. So for example, we know as teachers that sometimes you are taught that proximity is a way to get a student who is disengaged 
to pay attention. Clearly, you cannot do that when you're when you're fully remote. So we are working with um, our borough office to continue to provide learning opportunities for teachers, where although the same content and the same tasks and the same work is going to be expected and graded in the same way, um, how teachers deliver that instruction is going to look a little bit different. And I also can say that the fact that students are gonna be part-time at home and part-time in school, they're already gonna be in remote learning. So if school buildings were to close, it's really, really simple. The, the Google Classrooms are already set up. They're already submitting their assignments online. So it's going to be really easy to kind of pivot. Uh, and the Chancellor talks a lot about being very nimble. And, and this will allow us to be really flexible and to jump right into remote. Yes, for those of you who are asking about Lewis working for District 25, yes. Oh, that's um, me. I'm talking right now. Because he is fancy <laughs> and amazing, and he is um, – you know, just in terms of, of parent understanding, he is my chief of staff. Right. So, so he I mean, runs yeah. my office. <laughs> doing a good job. So this question pertains to the district. What happens if you have uh, a child that lives in different households due to divorce, and one parent wants the child to stay home remotely, and the other parent says, I want my child to go to school? What do you do with that in that situation? That's, that's not, well, that's not, you guys have to together on that that's not a school based that's not a school based so it, it's something that they're going to have to work out with contact you guys and say you need to to kind of finalize that okay um so uh again with the laptops children can they use their own laptops um that's a school based question school -based. okay yeah. Yeah, and I think in school, I don't know I if they should be bringing they would be up able to log into our system. Yeah. School. I don't know if they would have access. So we that that's we you would have to ask your school that. Okay. Access the DOE um, networks. Understood. So will schools test and trace uh, to ensure that siblings of a uh, of a student with confirmed COVID uh, will also be quarantined if they attend different schools? Yes, that, that one of the parts of the test and tracing is managing siblings. So, yes. Yes. Okay. Good question. All right. And what does the job of a cluster look, what does the job of a cluster look like in this new norm? How will it be collected? Are paper and pencil notebooks allowed? We, we uh, did we, we answer this question? question? Yeah, we had okay. submitted beforehand as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the question regarding how many students per classroom that we already discussed. Uh, uh, Joe, can I have a question? Go ahead. Um, so, uh, so, so, what is the grading policy going to look like? Is it going to be the same? Um, because, uh, because I know before it was just all remote learning. This whole thing. Now you have students in classes and students 100% remote. Is the grading policy going to be the same as it was before, or how is that going to work? So just as the, the Central did in um, when we went fully remote in March, they will put out some grading policy guidelines, and then schools will take those guidelines. And as an SLT and um, school-based decisions will be made around how um, how uh, individual schools' expectations will fit into the, the policy guidelines that will be coming from Central. There's also a question about um, students in remote learning taking tests and about academic, um, you know, um, integrity. Right, right. Can right. you, I think it kind of ties into that, Daniel. Can you talk a little bit right. about that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so I know that we've been having a lot of discussions in regard to this. I'm just going to tell you, parents, I've heard from a lot of teachers, um, one of the good things in District 25 is because of our focus on knowing students well, they know when parents are doing student work. And so that is really going to be a conversation with, um, between teachers and families during parent engagement time, just kind of checking to really start talking about, you know, there will be online assessments that are not used to penalize students, but what we call screeners, especially because of this learning time where we're going to start 
trying to track and understand gaps in learning that may have occurred during the March to June timeline. We know that there um, are lags that happen during the summer. So teachers, as part of um, us getting to know their students at the beginning of the school year, um, will be giving these screeners and assessments. So for parents to know that if you're taking these assessments for your kids, then your child may not be in a small group setting that may have helped them because there was only weakness in one part of a standard. So we are asking parents to allow teachers to do their work and do their jobs and, and to properly assess and communicate with children during this time. Because we also know that, um, that there's going to be synchronous learning every day in, um, in full remote. So, so there will be opportunities for teachers to really get to know students. So that might be tied into this question, whether the grading system, whether it's different between the fully remote or the blended, it's, it's the same, no? The, the, and, and this is where I'm saying Central will put out policy guidelines and then schools will engage in conversations about the work that's happening and what that looks like in terms of fully remote. Um, so, so more to come with that, but there will be expectations and grading policies around student completion of work, what and how we grade standards, um, and what that will look like. Okay. How do we address safety measures regarding students and staff when they're eating lunch? Masks will be off, but there's concern over best preventive measures. Do you have any comment on that? Yep, so we do know that we will continue to practice social distancing. And one of the, the policies is that students wear masks all day, um, except when they're eating. So I will ask for further guidance around what that will look like. It's a very good question. And ha hand washing and hand sanitizing before meals, you know, all, you know, all those things. Okay. Um, will child care be provided for days for the days students need to stay home? So the mayor did announce that there's going to be 100,000 seats for child care for the days that children are um, not in school uh, learning. Um, it's not affiliated with the Department of Education. Uh, they'll be using libraries and other uh, uh, buildings, uh, and information about that is forthcoming. But the mayor did announce 100,000 seats for students uh, for child care while they are uh, not in school. Okay. On the days they're not. Again, who will oversee students on lunch recess? I'm assuming that school based class. Home, school based. In terms of okay. Organizing uh -huh. the school. And then um, will teachers from their own school teach the fully remote students? That was already answered. Uh, uh, school buses. Any news on that? We have not heard. It's the number one question. I push for it every day. Um, as soon as we get that information, we will make sure it goes out to families. Okay. Now, with the remote learning, it, this might be with the asynchronous or not, but do the students have an option of going on and doing the work whenever they want, or is it... Uh, um, there, is room, there is room for flexibility, but there will also be schedules. So it is really important for parents that do need that flexibility to reach out to your child's school. Okay. Um, busing, we did that already. Um, will there be homework testing? That's school-based, and we already discussed that, correct? Yes. Um, rating, report cards, we discussed that. Uh, is it possible for parents to be given a choice to waive state tests? We have not heard anything from the state around testing yet. What about IEP meetings? Um, IEP meetings will be set up remotely. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, your school will be reaching out to you. Are there any? I know with the I with the IEP classes, are are there any special limitations on the number of students, other than the guidelines? So we would we will be adhering to those um, restrictions and 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 guidelines around. 
the makeup of each class and the requirements of the makeup of each class. Okay. Um, questions regarding the uh, the emotional issues. Is there going to be any type of uh, mm -hmm. guidance on that? Yes. So, so you know um, that uh, just from being on the DLT, Joe, and hearing me talking about this for years, that social emotional learning has been and continues to be a priority for me. So actually just today, we were talking about some key priorities and expectations within our district. One of them talks about knowing students well. The other is about co um, continuity of learning and what that looks like in terms of ensuring rigor within units of study. Um, and the other is around social emotional learning and what that looks like, right? So historically, um, when we did go fully remote in March, social emotional learning was something that you could see throughout all of our schools in things such as check-ins and, and working, with, um, uh, working with school guidance counselors. We continued as a district to train our guidance counselors and meet with our guidance counselors weekly and then bi-weekly, and we will continue to do that. Um, we've also uh, are working with our principals in um, some of uh, discussions about what our current expectations around social and emotional learning looks like, but we're also adding things about how we're doing check-ins with students differently now. Um, so we've given our uh, principals uh, a lot of the work from from the Castle website, which uh, does focus on social emotional learning, about how you're going to get to know students in a remote world when you're meeting them for the first time. So. So we are working on that. That is an expectation of the chancellor that social emotional learning is part of everyday learning and it should not be separate and apart. And our parents will see that um, in terms of the work that we're doing with students, both remotely and, um, and in the blended model. Thank you. Uh, is there any possibility that dual language or gifted and talented programs might not be continued due to the number of students and staff? Are they at nope. risk? We're, we're, we're on track with scheduling and, and organizing that as well. Okay. You can't answer questions regarding the Shazat at this point, right? It's No, I don't. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I have escalated it because it is a question that's come up often. So I have uh, sent that to Central just in terms of a question that our parents are asking. Okay. Uh, a lot of questions on that. Um, So if, if the school bathrooms are not hygienic enough, is there a place for children to report that? I uh, answered that question right below it. You did? I see it right there. Got it. <laughs> any, any adult in the school, any student can go to them, tell them something is not clean, and they will be able to escalate it to the appropriate person. And will the parents get to see a supply list of the PPE? Uh, a supply PPE. list? What PPE is coming into the school? What we have? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we can provide that for families. Is that school-based or is something yeah, that this? Get that from your school. Yeah. And it should also basically be the same supplies for all schools because we're buying it in bulk. Yeah. Okay. Um, going down the line here. Um, so what happens to those that those students that may not be? Uh, able to tolerate a mask for medical purposes or sensory processing disorders? What what happens in those instances? So those are conversations that, that would happen at the school level for students with sensory uh, processing issues. That's a developmentally, like, uh, right, developmentally appropriateness. appropriateness. Right. Okay. Um, questions about the laptops. So I know during the last, the end of the school year, there were a lot of fifth graders that got laptops and there were a lot of eighth graders that have graduated. So what happens when, you know? So those students should bring their laptops to, the, they can continue to use it at their next school, especially for the fifth graders in, in District 25. Um, and we will manage that come September. But for right now, they can bring those, uh, those laptops to their next school. Okay. How will, from your school ahead, in Wait, so the fifth graders will not be bringing back the laptops to yeah, eventually, their... Eventually, we'll get them they, back. They will. They will. Yeah. Well, right now, there's no right guidance. Now, right. Oh, For okay. right now, Hold on to it. we don't want students to start the school year without laptops. Oh, so, okay. Right. The, also, the iPads that uh, were sent out by the DOE, 
those iPads now become property of the school the child will be attending in September. Okay. Which is nice also. Understood. What about physical education? So physical uh, education. Will there be physical education? Physical education is an expectation, as is the arts, and, and you know that that's something that um, if you go online, the chancellor has released what those expectations are. Schools will be planning for them. What they will look like are questions that you should ask at the school level. Okay. How will dismissal work? Will social distancing be practiced in this situation? Yes. So social distancing is... Um, part of both arrival and dismissal, um, and your school principal will be um, explaining those procedures to you. But once again, where I say we work as a community, um, yep. it's okay. really important parents that we work within these guidelines to ensure safety and social distancing. So, um, so but your, your principals will be communicating that to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And will the school have enough Wi-Fi for all laptops they want in class. Yeah, yeah, yeah we had it when it was. Uh, and bandwidth is uh, is better now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and mm -hmm. are there resources for parents to learn how to support their children, similar to training for teachers? Yes, and that is a good question and something that we learned through this process. So um, we are working with our schools and our parent coordinators to provide those resources for parents, but we also saw that we need to have those same resources for students. So we are working on that. Okay. Is, there, is there room for, children, for students to socialize or interact with one another during a specific, specific period of the class day? So our social emotional learning work will encourage socialization while social distancing so but there will not be um opportunities for kids to see each other outside of their groups because remember we don't want that intermingling but there will be opportunities for students to socialize with each other within their pods okay this might be a school-based question but will there still be uniforms for kids who go to school that's a good, you, you're getting good, Joe. You know what's a school-based question? <laughs> that is a school-based question. But I can say most schools are, are like waiving requirements for uniforms and, and uh, school supply lists are different because of the situation. Okay. So that will be a school-based school -based, uh, situation. Understood. Um, now with the masks, right? So if, it's, if a student takes off a mask or he or she um after lunch are they expected to use the same mask will they be given another mask what's the protocol and i i answered this question right below it as well oh, what go, ahead. Say? go ahead they, if they can get a new mask if they need a new I mask know, i hope not this right we'll provide them with masks and yeah. there will be mask breaks during the day opportunity for you to you know kids to kind of take their masks off and and you know maintain social distancing and obviously, if a kid soils a mask throughout the day, you know, they, there's going to be plenty of masks for, for students, so they can always get a new one. So just comments about the domino effect. If somebody's tested positive and the, kids, the, the child is quarantined, then the family members would have. So it could really escalate. I think the, there's some comments about that concern. Um, uh, but what happens to the teacher or well, the classes? The, so you already answered that. Yeah, they, the, the, the tracing doesn't just include students, it also includes teachers. Adults, right. Okay. Um, I think I'm, I'm still going down here. I know, there's um, a lot. It keeps going, too. All right. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. So for the full remote students, can the, can the students see each other on the computer? I mean, is there, like, interaction between the students? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, does any other CEC member have questions while they work down the chat? Can I ask a question? Go ahead, Rashmi. So for the fully remote, uh, in-person uh, learning is five and a half hours. What is the time for fully remote or has that be not been decided yet? That That's going to be discussed in terms of uh, at the school level um, around what a student schedule will look like, and principals will communicate that. 
will there be drama or music classes? And how is that different from eating? I guess you're not wearing the right. mask. So what, Question, we, yeah. what we talked about is there have been expectations that have been presented to uh, community and principals through, about physical education and the arts, but actually what they will look like in the school setting is going to be happening at the school level. Okay, we already asked about, we answered the school hours, correct? The, I mean, it's school-based, right? The school-based thing. Right? Yeah. The schools will let you know when you get your schedule, the start time and the end time for students that are in in-person learning. Okay, no band classes, so we not. That's that's a school-based question. School-based, same right. with the questions. It has to be done times. Right. Right. My chat froze, Lewis. Okay. Um, uh, in school. What about I'm going back. I'm going through it. Right. Um, just just more questions about. Um. The working lunch and how that will, that will occur. Um, oh, that you already did that one. The drama and the music. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What look. time are you up to? I'm up to uh, nine oh three. What time oh, is it? That, that's Where helpful. Did? Thank you. It's there. Okay. Um, so I like to move the meeting along because we do have district planning. Um, so if there are other questions. Uh, I would ask that the parents submit the questions to their schools, correct? Or or they can submit yeah, them to absolutely. us, CDC? Right, absolutely. And some of them, like we went through, just in terms of recess, so we know that there's provisions that are made for recess, um, work and lunch time and what that will look like. Um, do we know the specific date that families can change their learning preference from a road to blender? We don't know the specific date, but we do know that they are going to be quarterly. Um, uh, can schools consider live streaming teachers in a classroom? Um, I don't think that is part of the discussion right now, but we will get further uh, details about that. Um, but we do know that our teachers will be communicating. Um, Kids love to use the chat, Claudia. Yeah, when yeah. the mic is muted, yeah. Yeah, we, we visit classrooms all the time. They actually like the better chat. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of times when I've been going into classrooms and asking kids questions, they answer me in the chat. They respond in the chat, yeah. They used to talk to each other that way. Yeah, it's fun. Well, I, I thank you, uh, Danielle. I thank you, Louis. I thank yeah. all the parents who had the questions. Um, I, just uh, wait, want I, just, I just want to answer two more questions. I think it's sure. important. So, so quarterly being a ten, if you're thinking quarterly around entry into remote, I want you to think marking quarter times. Like so when you normally when the marking quarter ends and students would get their report cards, that's the time that we're talking about. Um, and additionally, just know that we are working very hard as the District 25 community. And from what I said in terms of our understandings of curriculum and instruction and our expectations, that should we need to go remote anytime, those yes. expectations and learning will continue. We do know that the needs of students in a brick and mortar building and remotely are different, but the learning and our expectations will continue. Yeah, so yeah, remote learning always continues. Okay, so if, if anyone has additional questions, they can communicate with our office, they can communicate with their school principal and also the district office, is that correct? Yeah. Yep, I'll put uh, our phone put number our information in the chat. and our email address in the chat. Okay, perfect. So thank you. Um, I, I know we have, is uh, Zai Green here from District Planning or Rebecca Lichtenstein? Yes, yep, we're both here. Uh, I thank you for your patience and everybody. I welcome you. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, thank we're you, John. We're going to move on to that portion of our meeting, which deals with district planning, um, which is also an important topic. Um, you have something to present, Jai, right? And then we, yep. if we have any questions, take it from there, correct? Yes, yes that's good. great. You have the floor. Uh, thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Joe. So um, thank you all. I know you have put many hours into this meeting and it's been really interesting. 
you know, I think we're all grappling with what's going to happen in a month or so. Uh, so uh, anyway, thank you for hanging in there. Um, so I have a few of my team members on with me. So maybe I'll start with a couple introductions. Um, so my name is Zai Green. I'm the director of Queens Planning at the Office of District Planning. Uh, I met many of you about a year ago. We came out in the fall to your CEC to talk about this topic. And now we're coming into Zoom, uh, or I guess this is now Teams. Um, so I have a couple colleagues here. Do you want to introduce yourselves? Uh, Reba, Reba, Caitlin, Yuen Sure. Yes. Hi. Thanks, everyone. And I'm, I'm sharing my screen, right? You can yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just check. Um, thank you. I'm Reba Lichtenstein, the Associate Director of Queens Planning. And I'm Caitlin Whittemore. I'm the Planning Coordinator for the Queens and Manhattan Boroughs. Welcome. Hi, everyone. My name is Yuen Ming, and I'm the analyst for Queen's team. So um, we so we have a <clears throat> PowerPoint we want to share and then some data. So here's the agenda. And I know you've already been on this meeting for many hours, so we'll try to go quickly. But um, right now, usually I do a bit of framing about the place we're in with COVID. Um, I think that's been loud and clear given the last couple hours of questions. But we'll just say that, you know, normally at this time, we start doing district planning for the following school year. So at this point, it would be for the 2021-22 school year. Clearly, no one's exactly sure what's going to happen in that year. We're all hoping life will go back to normal. It may or may not. Um, but we do want to still keep planning because we have to, right? Um, we, we have to kind of plan for the time at some point when um, when life will go back to normal. Uh, but just realizing we're doing it in this context of COVID and everyone's mind clearly is on fall 2020. Um, also, I think a lot of people uh, have front and center the real like grappling we've now as a nation and actually a whole world come to with the you know the effects of systemic racism um it just it's an odd time to like then go back into dry data and talk about a year from now but uh we're gonna do it um we know that our data might change given covid um and if it changes we'll we'll pivot and we'll deal with it and we'll you know reanalyze everything but this is at the moment we're gonna um we want to come to you and share the data we look at when doing um, the district planning process, because we really have um, a commitment to, to working with you, with the community, with the superintendent, with the parents. So we want to come and just like share the data that we have and like talk about how we would look at it and get your thoughts on how you would look at it if you have thoughts for the district. Um, so we're going to do this as a team effort. I'm going to hand it over to Reba and Caitlin to start talking about some of the, uh, the district planning process. We do this again in the fall. Um, so pre-COVID, our intention was to come and just meet, like sit around a table with the CEC members and go over the data in like a like a working meeting. Um, it's a little harder to do over uh, over the computer, but actually it's been working pretty well. So that is our intention. And I'm gonna turn it over to Reba and Caitlin um, to start, and then we'll all be here to answer questions. Uh, let's go ahead, Reba. Or oh, sorry, Thank Caitlin. <laughs> Thank you. So the Office of District Planning is committed to equity and excellence by focusing its efforts on community partnerships and empowerment, increasing access to quality schools and programs, increasing diversity, and improving learning conditions for all students. So this is just an overview of the Office of District Planning's workflow. It's a cyclical process where we first determine needs for each district internally, then externally meet with DOE partner offices and CECs. After that, we meet with councils, school communities, and other stakeholders to assess potential scenarios and district needs further. So currently where we are at in the process is meeting CECs such as yourself to get input and thoughts on how to better flesh out what the most important needs for this district are. So listed here are a few of the levers district planning has utilized in the past where we work in collaboration with CECs to meet the needs in each district, particularly for zoning and unzoning processes where the CEC is the voting body. So some past examples of this in District 25 are the great expansion of 
PS 130 from a K3 to a K to 5 school in 2017, opening of College Point Collaborative in 2018, and adding programs such as the ASD Horizon at PS 219 or Bilingual Special Ed at PS 107. Great, thank you, Caitlin. So I'm going to um, kind of take over from here. And as I framed before, we do have a data uh, presentation to share with you all. Um, we wanted to kind of give the CEC, Joe, and, and the other members the, the option in the sense that we can either go through the entire lengthy document. We know you all have already been here for a while, um, or just kind of hit on a few you know, key high level points that more inform some of the district planning work. Um, we're happy to answer questions. And we did send this document to the CEC and it's available publicly. So can um, also come back at a later time and discuss further, but wanted to really kind of leave it to you all to let us know what would be the most helpful in terms of the data document, which I will share momentarily. Um, and then just wanted to frame the conversation in some of these guiding questions, um, thinking about the programs that exist in the district and some of the needs that uh, might be met by the district planning process that Caitlin just described. Um, and then this fourth question, which alludes to some of the, um, you know, the climate and the, and the current needs as I framed around COVID and, and some of the district needs that might now be a little bit more pressing. So I'm going to... I, I agree with you. I think we should cover the uh, highlights. And I know we have the documents, so we can review it. And if we have any questions, of course, we'll get back to you. Uh, you know, I, I've sat through your presentations before. I'm aware, you know, but I would appreciate if we could um, go on the option that you suggested, right? Um, okay. Absolutely. Go ahead. So let me pull up the data summary, and we will be as brief as possible. Uh, duly noted. <laughs> um, so we're going to just hit on a couple points here. Um, I did want to draw attention to the table of contents to just show that uh, there is a lot of data in this document. These are all of the different points. And as uh, Joe suggested, this is the type of data that we do present annually as district planning when we come out in the fall. Um, it looks a little bit different than in years past. We typically come out with a um, PowerPoint, but also share with the CDC kind of a Microsoft Excel workbook that has all of this data within it. And now we've been able to create a more uh, visually appealing and accessible kind of iteration of that same data so that folks can see it um, in chart and graph form with you know, colors and, and keys. So a little bit different in terms of looks, but the same content that we typically share and just wanted to point out that there is a, a table of contents that shows all the things in this document. Um, but as to not go through the entire document, I am going to scroll through. And if you see anything of note and want me to stop, please do. But we're going to kind of jump around to just a few key pieces as to uh, the work that informs district planning most, most closely. Kaylin, do you want to talk about the demand and capacity chart here? Sure. So uh, this graph shows how many elementary school seats are available in District 25 compared to their enrollment trends over time. So the bars at the bottom for 2020 on are actual and projected enrollment, and the pink line that you see here is the actual and projected capacity. So this is for district schools only, and it does not take the impacts of COVID-19 into account. It is purely based on the Blue Book and SEA's projections. So what we see here is that total elementary school enrollment is projected to increase over the next few years and that demand exceeds capacity in District 25 and the district struggles with overcrowding. So in order to help meet this need, several new capacity projects are underway to help add more seats, which Reba is going to get into a little bit later. Thanks. And then this is the same graph, but for middle school demand and capacity. So what we also see here is middle school enrollment is also expected to increase over the next few years, particularly beginning 2023 on, and the district struggles here with overcrowding as well. So district planning is monitoring future enrollment changes to address these potential seat challenges as they arise. 
Um, it's also important to note that this data is just one piece of examining how to look at seat demand and seat need in the districts. So you go out through 2024. So you're looking or projected the next four years, three years, basically? Is yeah. And, yes. And, you know, this is kind of the current cohorts as they exist now articulated forward and taking into account new housing in the district that might be coming online and, you know, some of the attrition we see across grade levels, um, kind of that's all embedded in these projections. And as Caitlin shared, you know, we don't yet have enrollment data as to the impacts of COVID. So these projections are based on the audited register from October. Um, so it could very well change and will, you know, as I said before, kind of pivot and think a little bit differently as these numbers may change in the coming months. Um, but given historic data and how it typically moves forward over over the years, this is what the total enrollment is looking like at the middle school level and on the page before at the elementary school level. Can you go back to the prior page? I'm sorry, with the elementary school. I got one. Okay. And then just a couple other data points we did want to highlight. Um, we do have breakdowns in this data summary of demographic data. This is the district-wide totals, um, and this is self-reported data based on the different racial and ethnic, ethnic uh, breakdowns that the DOE offers in their parent survey. Um, but with the K to 5, 6 to 8, and 9 to 12 breakdown compared to within District 25 compared to the borough and the city. Um, and then on the following pages, we have it by elementary school and just kind of wanted to offer this, you know, colorized visual for folks to see where in some places the schools very much align to the, the district averages that we see. And then maybe in some neighborhoods or in some schools, there is a different demographic makeup um, and just something that we look at for comparison when thinking about any sort of district planning needs or opportunities for increased equity and diversity. So these are the elementary schools on this page in the district and then on the next page. And I know there's a lot of data here, so I, I want to give folks time to see the breakdowns, but also we'll just plug again that this is available and, and can be examined further. Um, and the key down here are the different representations. And then on this next page is the middle school breakdown. So a couple of schools here looking very similar to the kind of district-wide makeup and a few schools skewing a little bit differently. And then just to keep us going and so much data, so much to see. Um, the one other piece that we did want to draw attention to is the new capacity um, that is coming online in the district in the coming years and some of the capital plan funded seats that we have from the school construction authority um, so this is uh, new capacity that's currently planned um, the addition at 129 is set to open in september and uh, school construction authority work was on pause for a few months when covid hit uh, the work that is projected to open in September was unpaused. So this and or this addition at 129 is um, kind of on schedule. And then these two additions, the Q032 and the Q169 additions had this anticipated opening date as of March when the last building completions report came out from the School Construction Authority. Um, you know, these projects have not yet been unpaused. They're in design right now currently, but the SCA has not yet updated these anticipated opening dates. They think that hopefully they'll be able to meet these dates, but having lost a few months of the timeline that they used to design and construct, um, this will be something that we'll have to kind of re-examine as we see, you know, the budget implications and the and the time implications of what was lost during COVID. So um, I'm not sure if I if I heard you correctly. So are those two projects still on pause? Or are they are, are they yeah, moving. so, so they're, they're on, they're still, you know, planned. They're just in terms of the actual construction or what would happen to um, begin the uh, addition being built has not yet started given the pause. So right now the SCA is really focused on those 
construction projects that were set to open this September and then, you know, all of the needs citywide to try to create any sort of additional capacity. So this work is still on pause, um, but these, you know, these buildings are still on the completions report. Just this date might uh, might be delayed. We don't know yet, but we will update Understood. you all as soon as we do now. Um, and then this, these numbers here, uh, funded seats, meaning that there is, you know, an identified need, which uh, Caitlin shared some of the, the gaps in terms of capacity in the district. There's definitely a need for new capacity here in the form of either construction or, or lease sites. Um, and there is funding in that capital plan for four seats in the district um, in these two sub districts that are listed here. So this means that, you know, the SCA is uh, when their work is on pause, is looking for uh, sites or available ways, opportunities to create more capacity in the district to meet some of that elementary and middle school overcrowding that Caitlin suggested earlier on. Um, so those were the kind of high level points that we wanted to draw your attention to. I know I scrolled through the document. I'm wondering if there was anything that uh, caught anyone on the council's eye or any other, you know, questions or points that we do want to delve into. Um, and again, you know, naming that this is kind of a difficult time to really think about long term planning. But if there are any sort of district needs that feel um, obviously space is one of them and, and we know that and we will uh, we're happy to talk about kind of how we can work to address that and hear any sort of feedback or questions that might come up. But did want to, again, just acknowledge that we know that Talking about 2021 might seem a little difficult, um, but we are here to answer questions if there are any. So my, my question, uh, not to interrupt you, I know it deals more with the current year, right? So I, I know that, um, and I don't know if you have the capacity to do this right now, but we're looking for space because of the social distancing. I'm advised that there are certain parochial schools mm -hmm. that may be closing. Uh, one of them where we have a UP a 3K center in white zone in our district. So it, is it an option? Is district planning looking at those spaces for the current year or is that off the table? In other words, is it an option to look at these schools in terms of renting space? Uh, to accommodate more students, or is that something that it's too late to do anything right now for 2020-21? Yeah, so um, so we work closely with the School Construction Authority, the, the SCA. Um, they're the ones that would actually go out and look and lease sites, and you know, um, they build schools, but they also lease the schools. They are looking for sites. They are aware of. Um, of a bunch of the Catholic schools closing or, you know, various other options. Um, they are also, um, they have an email address and a, and a website where if people know of sites that they should look at, you, you can, um, you can email them and they, they will then put that on their list to look at just like they always, you know, typically in a typical year, if you know of a site for new capacity that there's, they have a different email address that they'll just go look at. Um, they are actively looking and, so I can say that high level. What the actual result will be, I think, is, is still being determined. Um, but it is definitely possible that there will be new capacity for September for social distancing um, purposes, you know, non-DOE space. So it's not yeah. too late. Got it. But it's not through your office, basically. Well, we work. So what they would do is they would find this site that we work closely with them. Like we're kind of like their client, basically. So they will say, okay, do you have a need in this? this area for, you know, a school. Yes, we do, because we you know, we have overcrowding or we have whatever. Then they will lease it and then we would fill it somehow. So it's kind of a, a very cooperative process with the two of us. Yeah, and I'm going to post to in the site here on the chat. Thank you. Liz. I was going to say I'll post in the chat the link where folks can submit. Oh, somebody Too slow. Right Too slow. <laughs> Too slow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It's a competitive district. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, Rebecca, this is Victor. So these number, are they are these number including the uh, new buildings coming about uh, in certain areas? Or these are just based on the fact that it's over capacity at the current schools? The funded seat numbers? Yes. So 
these numbers are not inclusive of the existing seats. These are the seats that are funded for new capacity. The ones that are at either exist that are already accounted into this these numbers up here. The new seats that are being added are within this 1,000 number here. So the 3,056 number in the Flushing, Murray Hill, and Willits Point subdistrict has not yet been met. So those seats are still uh, funded. And then here, the 2,580 minus the 1,000 that's already in process are still available to be funded. So another 1,500 seats or so. And uh, there's probably a calculation involved, but like the, I'm, I'm, my concern is that right now there's a lot of building being built in the downtown Flushing area. So mm -hmm. they are going to be a lot of buildings here. So are these number factor in are the calculation for those um, buildings factor into these number in the future or do we have to wait for it to be uh, um i guess people are uh based on the school and they apply for school they have overcrowding and then it goes into this number so i'm not sure of how it's being calculated or does it take into consideration of those new uh, building being built yeah so both our team um in terms of enrollment projections does take into account new housing online. We work closely with the city planning office um, and similarly the school construction authority is aware of new housing that is coming online or being constructed and, and does incorporate that into their into their methodology and their planning. Um, Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Any other questions from you, Joe, or anyone else on the council? That we can uh, does anyone else on the council have questions? I'm going to stop sharing. So, I, I'm going to review it and I ask the other council members to review it and um, you know I, I would uh, you know for the public I don't know you know maybe we can you know at another CEC meeting perhaps if we coordinate something if there's something that uh, is significant maybe we can invite you to come back on an issue but um, I definitely will read it, and I would ask the other CEC members to read it. Unless you want to tell us anything more or something significant relative to our district that we should keep our eyes out for. I mean, I think Reba named something that you all on this meeting know, that this is an overcrowded district that needs more capacity. Right, right. So we are getting some, and then we will plan for it. So, you know, in an ideal world when everyone's brain space is not taken up by school reopening, we would love to like sit down again at a table with you and like really see what, you, if there are specific needs you see in the district, even like, hey, this school, you know, this is an example, like, I don't think we're doing a rezoning in this district, but you know, for example, some CECs will, will say, hey, we notice like this little part of the neighborhood is, you know, should be zoned to this other school, whatever, like whatever the, the needs are in the district sometimes uh, often the CEC knows like the granular details um, so if you know if after you look at this data that's the kind of stuff we would love to hear from you we're happy to come back or have you know conference calls or whatever but um, the main need I think right we, we see is is overcrowding in this district absolutely and I know there was discussion about building in the area um, west of Main Street where the, uh, right before the uh, city field, they, there's mm -hmm. talk about developing a whole new community there. So I don't know if that was taken into consideration in your analysis. Um, do you have any comments on that? So um, I don't know if, when, when you, you want to say something about the, how the analytics are done. Um, I know that projections of, if there is new housing, there is a projection of how many children will then attend a District 25 school. Um, I, I don't want to speak incorrectly. My my sense is like that doesn't happen until the project is actually there okay. and developed. It has to be yeah. there, right? Okay. Yeah. Understood. Um, anybody have questions? Anybody in the public have questions? Again, we are happy to come back. So we know it's this. Some of this is not top of mind right now, and you know, come October, November, when both we're able to use, you know, some updated data in terms of the impacts of the pandemic, but also when folks are maybe a little bit more well suited to have some conversations about long-term planning work. We are happy to come back. Um, 
plan to. So. Absolutely. So if there are no other questions, I wanted to thank you for your presentation. I wanted to thank you for your patience. I know this was a long meeting and uh, we look forward to hearing from you and working with you. Um, and thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Joe. Thank you. All right. Be well, stay safe. You um, too. And we, uh, unless anyone has any more questions for district planning at this time, um, I'm going to move on. Okay. All right. Um, thanks, Joe. Goodbye, thank everyone. Bye, okay. hey guys. Thank you. Thank Bye, Danielle. You thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Carly, are you there? I'm here. Okay. I don't know. Are there any other comments? Anybody? Any other? Anybody else who uh, wanted to go on the public speaking list before the meeting? Are they still here? That I know of. Uh, no. I think everything has been answered. Okay. Um, so, uh, that portion is done and, uh, do I have any motions to adjourn our meeting at this time? We went from a hundred, I think we were close to 200 to 42 41. present. <laughs> All right. And dropping. Are there Some any 18 people, uh, Joe? We only have 18 people now or less. No, there's 43 attendees and 15 40, present. Yeah. Yeah. We're, uh, we're good. Speaking okay. of space. District planning, they really, you know, they sent everyone away. Do I hear any motions to adjourn the meeting? Motion, motion to adjourn. adjourn. Okay, so we got Rushmi who moved and... Victor second. Victor seconded, okay. So the meeting, the public meeting of our general meeting is now adjourned. I thank you everybody. We're going to start our business meeting um we do have to do our business meeting and um just wanted to remind you that during the business meeting we have to coordinate our calendar meeting dates right and discuss the um the chancellor town hall so uh if we could just take a one minute break and then we'll start our business meeting thank you everyone and have a good evening right now <laughs> You know, I was thinking about district planning and about our overcrowdedness. And, you know, we're going to have another pandemic eventually. I think it's important to find the space. Yeah. I'm here. I just had to have a sip of my coffee. So you can drink uh -oh. coffee on camera. You could show everybody. You can Unless it's not. Oh, I know. A little, a little I had my daughter bring me my espresso. Is it a double no shot? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I thought that was important about, um, you know, space and uh, for the coming year because of the COVID, yeah. you know. Well, um, I mean, and they're, and they're saying that we're going to have another pandemic. It's just going to be, it's like inevitable. So. Right. It's important to if we are we are overcrowded and it's important to solve that problem. What? Stop that, Lewis. <laughs> this is Dr. Fauci. Danielle's yelling at her dog. <laughs> it's my dog. Stop it. So I I, sh I see other than our presence here, I just see six other get members of the public. Yeah. Right. Um. I also can't wait for these meetings to be in person again. For some reason, I don't do well with these remote meetings. Um, it's hard to follow a chat. Um, You're doing great, Joe. They tend to last very long. They, they tend to go a long way. I, I like that we have a lot of members present because that's important, you know. That's um, the key. You never would have 150 people in, in the conference room. Never, but that would be nice. Um, we can't fit 100. We people. did. No. We did. We had a couple of good full meetings when we had issues happening. We did. We did. It's not like this. We had 155 people at this meeting. Yeah. I know. All the um, all the in-person meeting will still be live broadcasted with a link, so people can attend. Yeah. 
you know, I, I like to make everybody happy, especially our parents. So I just hope I didn't exclude anybody on a chat or, you know, I know parents were frustrated because they couldn't get on, but I think that must have been on their end in terms of with the device. Yeah, yeah we don't, I don't know what the problem was. Are we ready to start the business meeting? You want to move on, guys? What time is it? It's 9.37 already. Is everybody here? I'm here. Yeah, here. I'm here. Okay. So let's start it, right? Carly, roll call. All right. Joe, sorry, give me one second. Joseph Benedetto. I'm here. Present. Christy Caniglio. I'm here. I see you. Rashmi Krishnaraj. <clears throat> Lilik Mujianti. I'm here. Monica Patino. Present. Edward Kim. Present. Victor Lee. Present. Tawana Rivera. So Tawana. And Akila Osorio. Present. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> no, no, I saw you. I saw you. Oh, okay. Happy birthday to Kelsey on Tawana. Thank you. It was Carrington's birthday. Oh, it's like there's a park over there. Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. So, we have a do we have business meeting minutes? I don't see them. Carl. Did you let me look here? Did we do a business meeting? Well, oh, that was part of the calendar meeting. Oh, we did. OK. Um, does everyone have the meeting minutes for the business meeting? Joe, last business meeting. Uh, remember, you did the superintendent evaluation, so that was the business meeting. Oh, we went into executive session. OK, yeah, so nothing to approve here. Got it. OK, so, um, you know, we never coordinated our meeting dates for the remainder of the year. So that's something we need to do this evening. Um, we typically meet on the first Wednesday of every month. Uh, maybe we can go through the calendar with uh, Carly and because some dates are like the first of the month or whatnot and just, you know, coordinate a date. We don't have to go on the first Wednesday of every month if there's something that conflicts. So uh, are you guys okay to go through the re remainder of the year? Right? Carl, you there? Yeah, I'm here. All right, so we didn't coordinate our September date, but the first Wednesday in September is September 2nd. Um, I personally might have an issue with that date, but um, I would ask if we could do it the following week or another day. Um, it's my 16th wedding anniversary. Um, and um, but I, if I have to be on, I'll come on. Um, do we have suggestions on uh, when you want to meet in September? For me, what's the ninth? Are we OK with Wednesday, September 9th? Does anybody have a problem with that? That's fine. I mean, uh, it's closer to when school is supposed to start. I don't think, we're, I, I'm not going to say anything, but if we're supposed to start on the 10th, is that going to be a conflict with anything? Danielle? No. All right. So I, th I think that's a good, by September 9th, we'll know if we're going to start on the 10th or not. Yes. And I'm sure we'll get a lot of parents joining us that evening. So let's, <laughs> uh, do I have to do this by motion? Um, or can we all agree on September 9th for September? Diana, right? Diana, are you here? Yes, sorry, I am. How um, are you? I've been, I'm okay, thank you, thank you. Great meeting. Um, yeah, you can, because you're changing, you're changing something that's set in your bylaws, you might want to um, just take a quick vote. Okay, okay. thank you. So let's go through a vote. Do we are we uh, let's vote for who's OK with having our September meeting date moved from the first Wednesday, the second through the to September 9th. I'll just go through the roll call. OK. All right. Joe, Joe uh, Joseph Benedetto. Yes. Christine Caniglio. Christine yes. Yeah, I'm here. Yes. Rashmi Krishnaraj. Lily, 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 I can't hear you. 
Yes. Okay. Monica Cristina? Yes. Edward, Edward Kim? Yes. Victor Lee? Yes. Juan Rivera? Juana? Yes. And Akilo Osorio? Yes. Thank you. All right. Okay, so uh, basically the September meeting is uh, going to happen on the 9th. The right? October meeting is the um, town hall, but I don't remember the exact date. I got to look it up. Look okay, at it. so that's going to tie in. Um, I know Diane is here. She's helping coordinate. So I we we did not actually lock in the Oct October date for the town hall with the chancellor. Um, I wanted some flexibility, so I asked Diana if she can, hold, you know, it's either going to be October, November, December, correct, Diana? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you guys want to do your town hall in October. It's kind of soon. Um, what, do you, what are your thoughts? Because if we decide to do in the town hall in October, then we need to coordinate according to the chancellor's schedule. And it won't be the first Wednesday in October. Yeah, it would be great if at this point, um, and considering his schedule, you can give me kind of two months that would that you would prefer. I mean, you know, we spoke about this, and I and I put you down for, as you said, Joe, um, October, November, or December. If you agree, I will I will do the same, and then I'll come back to you um, with the dates that he has available in order for you. Um, you know, make a final determination. Okay, so is it fair to say that October is too soon for the town hall? Does everybody agree on that? Does somebody disagree? Yeah, I think the later. I, uh, I later is better. I think we we would be better off to wait just to kind of see what happens in September and October, as far as the school, the reopening. I think the later we wait it's going to be more productive to hear from the chancellor. So you can go into January, like January through June. And I think that those months are actually less challenging from this perspective. Um, right, because most most councils that do not yet have a town hall uh, want, wants to have it by the end of the year. But I think that would be a lot easier if you guys want to have it later, uh, you know, after January. You just need to let me know and give me a couple of options so that. Uh, so we have the the town hall with the chancellor is every other year, correct? Or is that every term with the CEC? How does that work? Yeah, um, it's a it's a it's every it's every term. So the chancellor is obligated um, by state law to have a town hall in each district during the during the term of the CEC. So yes, um, the deadline is the. You know, June June 30th next year. Okay. It, it, does it look like he will ever have a an in-person town hall, or is it already that not, you know? Not any time. The time rest of the year so. it's going to be so. There's no chance that he's going to have an in-person town hall in February or so. Correct? No, I mean right now it doesn't look like that. Okay. Um, so. Fair enough to say that we're not going to do the town hall with the chancellor in October, correct? Anybody? Correct. Yes. Okay. Correct. Um, yes. Does any does anyone have any objection to having the town hall after in, in, in January or thereafter? I'm okay with it. Yeah, no, I don't. It's fine. It's okay. So Again, any month, any month from I January. I think if we do it sooner it's going to just be uh focused on the COVID situation i don't like this COVID thing you know it just controls everything right so i i'd rather go on to like hot topics other than COVID, hopefully um and i think there's enough communication with the chancellor and other town halls that we can participate if we have any issues regarding the COVID. so fair enough to think that let's wait till after january correct so we don't have to commit right now on that. Perfect. Does anyone disagree with me? I'm assuming we're good. Okay, so now October, 
right? What's the first Wednesday in October? Carly, I put it in the chat. If you see, it says 10 to the CC oh, meeting dates. Okay. So that goes from October to July. Those are the first Wednesdays. Okay. And Danielle, you usually tell me if I, like, if there's a date. Yeah, I know, but we don't have the kind of calendar yet. So, I'm so we could be flexible, um, right? Because if something arises that we need to change it, we can always send out notice of, uh, of a change. Yeah, the tentative meeting, you know, tentative meeting. Uh, uh, fair enough. Let's say let's put October. Everybody okay with October seventh? Um, November fourth is that the day after election day? Or is that election day? Not sure. November fourth is a Wednesday, so election. I don't know when the election day is the third. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so election day is the third. Um. So we should be okay. December second. Be Any objections to that? January 6th. Is that a holiday? Let me look at my, I'm going to bring up my. Three Kings Day. For yeah, that, it's not a legal holiday. Schools are open, right? Yeah. Okay. February 3rd. March 3rd. April 7th. Nothing. May 5th. Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo. Is that a holiday? I mean, I know it's a holiday. It's, it's a holiday. holiday. I'm, I'm Actually, good. Yeah, it's a holiday on Bell Boulevard. I don't want to have a CEC meeting on Cinco de Mayo. Can um, we have margaritas? <laughs> I love Cinco de Mayo. Can we, can we make sorry, money? I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry. It's not I a holiday. Sure. It's not a holiday. Sure. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's not a school holiday, but in the evening it may cause some conflicts. Any objection to, um, to taking a vote to hold it the following week? May 12th? Aye, aye. Or do you want to leave it May 5th? The 12th is fine. Okay, let's take a vote on that since we have to take a vote on it. Ready? Yes, for the 12th. Christine Coniglio. Christine? Yeah, yes, I'm here. I'm here. Rushni Krishnaraj. Yes. Where are you sitting, Christine? Outside? Yeah, I went outside because the kids have to walk the dog, so I have to watch them. I don't like them out in the dark. Sorry, <laughs> so I'm sitting on the porch while they walk in the dogs. Lilith Vigianti? Yes. Monica Brown? Yes. Edward Kim? Yes. Victor Lee? Yes. Joanna Rivera? Yes. And Akila Soria? Yes. Okay, so uh, unanimous that the May meeting will be held on May 12th. Then we got June 2nd. Usually, I don't know what's going to happen with our, well, any objection to June 2nd? I'm okay with it. it. We can still do it viral. Um, viral, right. Viral. <laughs> can we change that word? I don't know. <laughs> Is everybody okay with June 2nd? Okay. So uh, July, isn't that the next term? Do we pick that date? July meeting? Yeah, you pick July, you gotta wait, on, and then, then the next term picks August. You yeah. July. So, although we may not be here, correct, Diana, we still pick the July date? Yeah, I mean, um, customarily, um, you know, councils just leave that July date to be whatever it is in the bylaws. Okay. So, that so that's even for the 7th. The next that's council, yeah. That's the first Wednesday in July, so let's leave it at the 7th, all right? So we are good with our tentative CEC meeting dates. Carly, you can send something out to the public, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and of course, I would put something, if there's any need to change a date, we can uh, always uh, move it to says a that, uh, tentative, you know, that they're, they're subject to change. Got it, okay, as long as you have that on the notification. So um, another thing to, that we need to discuss, well, maybe not now, but something for us to consider 
CEC elections, right? So um, when does that start, Diana? Yes. Um, well, most probably um, in January. Okay, so um, we have a few months. Pretty much on the same on the same schedule. Um, I believe that the the election yes, process has changed. Correct? It's not the. Yes, the timeline has not changed. So we still we still um, have to announce it in January. We still have 90 days um, to conduct the elections. Um, what has changed indeed is the is the fact that now um, instead of only the three mandatory officers of each PTA voting, it will be um, pretty much like one one student one vote. So the parents of one the each the parents of each student, but only one of the parents can, um, you know, can vote in each district. So, so yes, we'll have to, we'll have to. So do one vote per family. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes, exactly. Um, it's actually linked. Yeah, it's actually linked to um, to the OSIS number of the of the students. So, um, you know, if you have students in in um, you know, different districts or your vote goes with that. So, you know, theoretically, um, a, you could vote in multiple elections. And is it one vote per family or is it one? In other words, if a family has five kids. It can be five votes. Five votes. So it's one vote per student. One vote yeah. per student. Yeah. 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 Yeah, okay. exactly. Like the, the identifier will be the most probably like this is where we are right now. We still like I'll let you know if you know we, we're still in discussion and brainstorming um, things at this point, but we will most probably use the OSIT number as an identifier. Okay. Diane, is that state law? Because that means like if I have five kids, I get more of a vote than somebody who has one. Well, it's better than one parent, one vote in which some families that have two parents get more votes than a child who has only one parent. Uh, but yes, it is it is state law. However, the, the Department of Education um, decides how to interpret and, and then implement. But yeah, changes to state law were, were made last year. OK, so there are going to be changes in the election, but there are not going to be any changes in the role or function of the CEC representatives, correct? That's a, that's a good point. Um, yeah, that's correct. Got it. OK, so we, we can deal with that as we get further on. Um, in terms of the agenda for our next meeting, is there anything that's coming up on the table? Danielle, Diana, Carly, what do we usually do in, in, in September? Well, I think with September, we're going to have a little bit more clarity on you know, what the opening will look like and, and be able to clearly define certain things that right now are coming school-based level decisions. We'll be able to talk a little bit more as a district on what some of the decisions school communities have made regarding scheduling and programming and what that would look like. And I think that's important because you know, as of right now, I think parents did have a lot of questions about uh, individual school issues and decisions that would be made. You know, I think we clearly communicated things just such as masks and safety precautions and, you know, centralized things that will be in place. But, you know, they, they were more into looking at, you know, what their kids school day would look like right, in their school buildings. So I think we'll be able to define that a little bit more. OK, so what, there's nothing else that we should put on the agenda at this point. If there's something that comes on, I will uh, communicate it to you, right? Yeah, uh, right. Other questions that they've asked, I don't know, you know, in terms of the Shazat, I know that comes up a lot in the community, what they'll say about that. I don't think that's been clearly defined. I mean, the SATs haven't been clearly defined, so I don't know um, what that those things will look at. But we'll look out for that as well. Okay. And even our state, our state testing, you know, we won't know until we get closer. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Uh, do we need to discuss anything with regard to the budget? Are we good with the budget, Carly? Or is that Rushman? Who's that? Who's our treasurer, uh, Rushman? Um, I'm just 
was going to ask, what happened to the laptops? The Carly, is there a way to find out when was it mailed or maybe Diana knows about it? When was it mailed? Or was it mailed? I got a phone call confirming my address. I got a call confirming the yeah, And they said they were sending them out, but I haven't received anything. Right. Me as well. We all got so a Carly. I'm listening, Diana. No, I just didn't want to interrupt. Um, if you if you have information, did you place the order? Do you know who the vendor was and all? I have no idea. You know, it went through. It went through. Um, put it in that spreadsheet. I got it. I got it. Okay. I all will... I thought was a call saying asking to confirm my address and everybody else's address, and that they were mailing it, but I don't know from there what happened. Okay. I think the Dragomira can find that information for you, yeah. but if, and you can call directly. I'll the call in the morning then. Okay. Yeah. And if you have any problems, then I'll, you know, let. So, so I, I know we have $25,000 in our budget, correct? I don't know what we could do with our budget in light of the COVID, but what I would suggest, and I'm, it's an interesting question, Danielle also, if I know there are a lot of questions from principals regarding setting up fiberglass or the, you know, the, the, the plates in the, in the classrooms, and if it's not provided by the DOE and schools are looking to purchase that on their own, through their own budget, is it something that we as a CEC may want to consider donating towards the schools in our district? Or is that over? I could, I could be mistaken. First, the first thing is, is I, I need to get more guidance just around the expectations of that, you know, around some schools having plexiglass and others not having plexiglass and, and just access and equity around what that would look like. But I, I could be mistaken. I know this has come up in years past. I don't believe the CEC budget can be used to buy money for individual schools. I'm not 100% sure. Diana, maybe you can respond to that. I don't know if that's a restriction. Um, yes, it is. I mean, I, I know that I know that we live in difficult times, so I can. I'm more than happy to, um, you know, talk to our deputy chancellor or maybe Samantha Belaski to see um, what advice we get from them, right? Um, but yes, that's that's absolutely correct. Because your budget comes from DOE budget, you're not just supposed to give it back into a DOE budget. But you again, know, right? And and maybe um, just something for you guys to think about. And I don't know if this is a budget piece, but just a community piece is that maybe we can work together with Lewis and myself and and Central DOE to do um, something for parents around um, logging on and just an intro as parents were asking today, you know, what's happening per school and um, just like a computer tech sort of time frame to maybe uh, think about planning that for the future. You know, if, you know, we always did like community based uh, uh, events and now maybe we can do a virtual event and maybe you guys can start talking about what you would want that to look like and, and how we can support that in, in a different way. Um, but I don't, you know, in terms of budget, I don't have any recommendations. Uh, I, think, I think it's a good idea. I mean, we usually, I mean, everybody. <laughs> we usually like to give our community something. So we usually have these events that we did in the past. So maybe, you know, in light of the situation, we can host some type of event like Danielle said, you know, we give back to the community something to assist. Um, and if we can, you know, somehow contribute or show something to the community on behalf of the CEC, I, I think that's a nice idea, right? Yeah. Um, like we do the award ceremonies, we do something, you know, to help the parents, right? Um, and then touching base on our goals. So I don't know what happens with our goals now because there's so much more taking place. Um, something for us, we never really, you know, took off on that, right? Um, maybe we can think about it and uh, during our next business meeting, because I know it's late, uh, maybe we can, you know, start talking about what our goals are as the CEC for the, for the remainder of the year and start working on that. Does anyone have any objection to that? You know, 
I, I just want to kind of throw something out at you guys to start thinking about. So, so we know that special ed was um, something that um, Tawana and Akila had brought up, and it's still going to be a concern, you know, even in in the virtual world. But um, so so that goal can continue. I know that that's you know something our communities are you know, are concerned about, and, and just different perspectives and what that would look like. Um, you know, I also think that this might be uh, something you guys want to talk about in terms of uh, cyberbullying and seeing, you know, now more than ever how we can manage that, um, and and just in terms of reporting and how we address that, and and who are resources at the DOE that can support that, and and um, you know, do something for parents as well. So just kind of throwing something out there around where your goals, the directions your goals went, because um, um, I know that safety. Uh, and safety could be something that we talk about too, and just in terms of like COVID and, and how schools are are um, implementing some of the safety guidelines. Just just a, a few things to throw out. There. Good ideas. Uh, any other suggestions from any other council members? <laughs> you kids are so cute, to us. It's been a three hour meeting. I'm exhausted. I'm not sure about you guys. Can I, can I just, I'm going to say one last thing before we, uh, um, so I don't know. Um, I do know that there were some concerns and I'm looking at a, a chat that Lewis had sent to me. Um, but also I know that Rashmi had mentioned that there are people that for whatever reason, and, and we know that we're having issues in, um, in teams. I know that myself, sometimes my chat shuts down and there's a, a couple of, of things that are coming up. So I don't know, Carly, if maybe you want to look into that this month to see why that's happening, because um, there are people who, like maybe you could reach out to DIIT and, and ask for support for the council and say, we're using Microsoft Teams. Is there another platform you think that might work a little bit better? Um, I don't know, you know, because this is, I'm, I'm actually looking at something and, and we know that it says the administrator has disabled a chat for one or more users. We know that that is kind of something that does come up in teams and we don't know why. Um, so maybe we should figure that out because we do have some community complaints that they can't see or, or respond on the chat. So I can, Lewis can send you somebody from DIIT that um, you know, at our local level, that might be able to help you. So at least we have an answer for the community. You know, I know that Lewis was telling people to kind of log off and log back on, but I do see a lot of people like leaving the conversation and coming back. I don't know if that's their own kind of systems or they have to. I, I don't know. So maybe we could just talk about that because we wouldn't want the community to say like they can't communicate during the meeting. Okay. We'll talk so. I have to say that most most councils use Zoom for their for their meetings. Um, so, and and we do have professional level um, you know accounts that accommodate uh, you know uh, 300 people. And I think that's today we we received um, an increase in that in that um, you know number. Is there a, a limitation on our Microsoft Teams, on the on the Microsoft Teams? It's I don't think it's, it's, it's two hundred and fifty people. Yeah, that wasn't the problem though because that we wasn't didn't the problem. There. The problem is like there are just so like at first you if it's one person you could say it's one person right, but but Rashmi said she was asking questions for people too, um, because they couldn't get in the chat either. So I don't know. Um, right. I don't know why it's happening only at CEC meetings. Maybe because so many people are coming from outside the organization, Lewis. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But, so that's not the problem. But what what I was what I was saying is that most councils use actually all councils I know use Zoom. There might be, but all councils that I know use Zoom. They don't have, this is not me. They don't seem to have any technical problems. Um, so you might want to try that platform, and I'm more than happy to give it to Carly. If I log into Carly, it's used by uh, by your account. 
So Dude, if we opt to use Zoom, Zoom, who's going to? Uh, yeah, well, Carl, Carl, you would have to add that. Now, um, Christine, um, see yourself on mute for a second. Allow me. Yeah. Um, yeah, see, Carly, you would have to manage all of the things that Lewis manages. So you see, like, but I, I think the CEC should have their own account, too, Diana. Do they give the CECs their own account? Um, Carly, Carly has access. Yeah, Carly has access, but we have, we at FACE have, um, um, you know, cer certain features that are, you know, more appropriate for public meetings. So, um, through Zoom. Through Zoom, yes. And you do uh, training for AAs? Yeah, we did training for AAs, but honestly, honestly, um, what what Zoom has, the trainings that Zoom themselves post on their website are actually the best, the best trainings. Um, and they did one for us, so I can I can offer the recording um, of that. But it's also many AAs are managing this already for months since March um, using Zoom. So I can always put Carly in contact, um, you know, with with other administrative assistants who've been doing this for a while and know um, the tricks. So do we, ha Carly? Are you, are you able to do the next meeting in Zoom? I mean, does do we have any objection in trying Zoom for our next meeting? Do we have the professional version, or is this is a? Uh, um, if yeah, we don't a, have it. It's a pro version. It's a okay. pro version, and and you can also choose webinars. So it depends on what you know. The the, the feeling of the meeting is different. Um, with webinars, you can disable chat and have a more orderly orderly meeting. So wait until the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the public comments in order to open it up to the community. Some councils prefer that. Some others prefer to do it the way you do to to constantly interact with the with the audience during um, you know during the meeting. Uh, but of course, in chat, there were situations in which um, uh, you know conflicts um, you know escalated, and and then they you know councils decided to disable chat the the, the chat function and move to a move to a webinar format. Anyway, like. Both of those things are are being offered. I'm more than happy to give all of you my contact information. I mean, my my login credentials in order for you to explore it. Um, and I will also be able to help um, Carly at your next at your next. Meeting. Okay, so why don't we? Um... And Lewis can also help. Like, I'll just give you my contact information if if willing. Yeah. So... I mean yeah, and 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 Joe, you know that Lewis and I are always more than we are a, a full support for you guys. That's not why I'm saying it, mm -hmm. but I also think um, it would it would be a good piece for the CEC to manage their meeting. You know, yeah. to kind of so if if Carly struggles, who else? Like maybe the the secretary could kind of come in and and sort of manage that stuff as well. Who's the sec? Is that's Victor, right? You know, Victor's the treasurer. Who's the secretary? So um, secretary. Have, uh, yeah. Victor. Victor. Oh, Victor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I mean, so then maybe Carly and, and Victor could coordinate together. So it's it's um but it's up to you. I mean we're we're here for, for whatever you guys want. So it, I just don't want I don't want if there's something in terms of what we're using, which is a DOE um you know, the DOE teams account, like it doesn't happen. What's happening to you guys doesn't happen with anyone else. Except it, it happens to us in the beginning. Remember in the beginning, principals will lose the chat. I know. Yes, I know. It it. It now it. They fixed it at the DOE level, but I don't think it's happening. I don't think they fixed it because I don't know. I don't know the reason that's happening, but I don't want members to think that their their voices are not being heard. And they like if you know, Rashmi has a group of people that ask her questions, but what about other people? We don't know how many other people tried to get into the chat that couldn't. So we don't know. I'm just like kind of saying that I just wouldn't want that for people to think that. Got you know it. that. So if we use our own, if we use the, the Zoom account, it would be our own Zoom account. In other words, Lewis wouldn't be able to help so us. So every DOE employee has the licensed version of Zoom? 
Mm-hmm. So that anyone with a DOE email address, so that could be Carly's email address, it could be my email address. Um, uh, the the council, you could not create a licensed meeting, but Carly could schedule the meeting and you guys could all join and you would benefit from all those licensed features such as 300 person capacity, right. unlimited time, it's encrypted and protected and blah, blah. So. Okay, so why don't we try it? Right. Maybe Carly can, you know, touch base with Diana and the training and give it a shot. And let's and we have time. We have until September 9th. Right. Um, And if it if if Carly doesn't feel comfortable, uh, we'll take it from there. I mean, that's my suggestion. Right. Carly, you there? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so just today, as I said, we, we received an email saying that, um, you know, additional Zoom webinar rooms are available. Uh, I know. Get, get, get one for me, Diana. It can work. I need a webinar code. Me. <laughs> I can do webinars. <laughs> exactly. And five and, and 1,000, so which, yeah. which we need for trainings and for Chancellor's town halls, but... Um, Anyway, like and it's I, nothing we have to purchase, correct? Because no, I'm looking at no, Russian. No. Okay. okay. No. All right, so let's try it, right? We can. Um, so when do you want to schedule a test Zoom meeting? We can do a test. Well, Car- 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 let's talk to Carly, right, Carly? So. Um, Up to you, I, you know, whenever you tell me. In the next couple of weeks, let's just try to run a test at one time, you know? Um, Yeah, so I will give you my credentials. I, I think that you lost Saucy. I don't think that all DOE employees have webinar access. Yeah, no. Uh, but I do, and it's, you know, it's not personal, it's for work. So I will share my contact information. Set uh, up. So happy to do that. I, I'll, I'll send this tomorrow. And I, right, and I can so put you follow up. Yeah, they're excellent. They're excellent trainings on the website. Like excellent trainings, and they are um, CECs, CECs of doing this while. And to answer your question, or I think Christine's question, yes, five, or whoever asked. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember. But um, a, a, a parent with five children will vote in five elections. Wow. Interesting. Mm-hmm. State law. Okay. So, is there anything else to discuss at the business meeting? Everybody good? Just out of curiosity, have we heard anything about our borough president appointees? Good question. Yeah, we received we received a lot of applications. Um, I believe Monica told me that the deadline for accepting applications is, I forgot, I, I think that, um, you know, Friday, our, our ethics officer will be able to um, vet everyone by August 22nd. Then there will be interviews and then the board president will, uh, will appoint. So maybe, maybe September or October. But yes, like it, they, they did a they did a great campaign, and we received close to 30 applications. Uh, and this is only, for, only in Queens, and um, it's a much higher number than. For District 25, we received 30 applications. No, for Queens, for Queens. Okay. So, for District 25, you received one, two, three, four. Four, four applications. Did we finally get Brooks? Is hers finally in that batch? For the, you know. Give me a second. Give me a second. What's the last name? Sturgeon. Sturgeon. She came to our meeting. She's been coming oh, yes. to our meetings. Yes, yes, yes. She did. She. Did. Yeah, because her application has been uh, sent in like a zillion times. So. 
<laughs> she actually <laughs> served on the CEC last term. Yeah, I followed. I followed. I sent several. Em you guys told me. Right. That yeah. The application has been sent. We didn't. I do not know where. Not to us. I, I emailed her several times, and I copy. I mean, I sent it to you. Montgomery also. Okay, Montgomery. Yeah. But she has been approved, right? So all we do is is vet for eligibility and then conflicts of interest. Right. I just want to make sure that hers wasn't lost again. Um, it in... was never lost. As far as I know, it was never lost. OK. Um, so we, we keep asking on a monthly basis and the year goes by. We're already in whatever it is. <laughs> Yeah. Ten but months that's, later. That's not because we did not. But that's right. not because we did it's not, not. I know it's not. It's the borough president. It's the. I, it was lost in cyberspace. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, honestly, DOE has a lot of email addresses, right? So the what I can tell you is that the email address that is included on the application, like that inbox, did not have um, her application. But every time you would you would ask me um, about her. I would actually send her an email because I do have email address in the database. Right. No, I just, I just, you know, she was a, um, she was very eager, so I didn't want to lose. It's hard to get people to volunteer. It's hard to get people to step up. So I just didn't want to discourage her sure. in her interest to be involved. That's all. I'm just following up on that. Yeah. You no, know. That, makes, that makes perfect sense. And I also personally asked the borough president, I had a meeting with her and, you know, she never got back. I know uh, council member Paul Vallone made the request as well. It's just like we keep bringing it up, but it just doesn't happen, which is odd. Um, yes, but they, it's just I, frustrating. Yes. <laughs> Not only for you. I mean, there are a lot of there are, I know lot there are other of districts, too. Well, CC 30 doesn't have the one. Um, um, and I think that that's actually it in Queens North. Everyone else has, um, you know, 28 has a vacancy. So, you know, 29 has a vacancy. Well, and now 24 has a vacancy. 24 has a vacancy because it's really fine. Sorry. Anyway, to, to their credit, like whatever, you know, motivation was missing before, um, like they did an excellent campaign. I mean, all of a sudden we received close to 30 applications in the past like two, three weeks. So that's, that's, that's quite a bit. Yeah, well, the borough president sent it to all the Queen's council members, and then the Queen's council members sent it out to all their constituents and posted it on social media, because I saw it on many different council people's social media pages. Yeah, me too. Like it was, it was quite, it was quite amazing. Even we receive applications even for councils where there isn't a vacancy. So uh, that should tell you something about the level of excitement. <laughs> they all thought it was something new. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Well, they'll serve for half a term. <laughs> well, I'm sure because it's virtual now, it's probably more appealing to people. Yeah. that normally wouldn't have stepped up to do it. So because everything is virtual. Yep, you're right. I mean, look at the participation. Like all public meetings that we have, the participation tripled. Um, like, yeah. Got it. I like your background, Lewis. What is that? Kind of psychedelic there. He's in a video game. You're muted. Ha ha, you're muted. Okay. You're so, still muted, uh, Lewis. We, we have, can't hear if, you. If, if there's nothing else, uh, are there any motions to adjourn our business meeting? Motion to adjourn, Monica. Thank you, Monica. Victor Lee, second. Thank you, Victor. So, uh, hold on. There's another message here. Uh, thank oh, you, Sujin. That was very nice. Um, Your hair looks great. Did you get it done? I'm sorry? <laughs> Your hair looks great. <laughs> oh, I, I cut 15 inches off my hair. Wow. Thank you. You did say that. End on a good note. <laughs> Thank you. Very nice. 
Okay, so our meeting is adjourned, everybody. I look forward to seeing you in September. I'm sure we'll communicate beforehand. Carly, when you do the training for the Zoom session, if anyone, you know, CEC members want to join in, we'll, you know, we'll, oh, I'm sure we'll see each other at, the, at our touch base. Tell Ava or Olivia to say hello that's behind you, Joe. They just snuck out. <laughs> that's no, my I, wife. That's Carmel. Oh, that was Carmel. I didn't look like her. <laughs> They crawl on the floor. <laughs> it's okay. So um, we have a touch base. We, did we agree on when we're meeting on the touch base next week? Is it Wednesday yes. or Thursday? Thursday. I, I already scheduled it with all the other CECs. That's uh, for next Thursday, correct? Yeah. Thursday 5, 5, 30. Okay, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so for, for those of you who can make it, we look forward to seeing you. Yep. Other than that, are we good? Good. Night. Thank Guys, you. Guys, it was a great good meeting. Night. Thank you so much. Let's hope everything. Good night, works everyone. Out. Good night. Good night, everyone.